Starting our list off at number 10, Lake Neos. We love talking about Pompeii. We can't get enough of it. I'm fascinated. They have a restaurant that's back and open now in Pompeii. It's crazy. Now that's quite the eruption. Historically, that's a bad one. That's pretty scary. But a recent eruption in 1986, well, we don't talk about this one enough. First of all, a limnic eruption is a rare event, so you can sleep not in fear tonight. It occurs when CO2 dissolved in deep water lakes suddenly erupts. Cause uh, yeah, that can happen. Who knew that? That's why I don't like lakes. There you go, right there. These events have only been observed twice, the deadliest being Lake Neos in 1986. When a limnic eruption occurs, large clouds of CO2 form, which then all of a sudden descend and drop below the oxygen in the air, causing all living things in the vicinity to choke and not survive anymore. In this case, the cloud fell on nearby villages, ultimately causing the deaths of 1,700 people and 3,500 livestock. Number nine, the Spanish flu of 1918. The Spanish flu of 1918. Okay, yeah, this one's probably pretty good. Since we know a little something about plagues now in real life and toilet paper and stress, let's turn the clocks back 95 years when the Spanish flu entered the game. What was it like back then? The Spanish flu, if you didn't know, it was a strain of the H1N1 virus, which we all know as well. And when it hit, it took 50 to 100 million people very fast. 4% of the world's population gone. Now, it was recent and it was quite horrible. We couldn't stay home and watch Ozark for that one, so instead, the Spanish flu is said to have spread so violently because of soldiers being in close quarters during World War I. Yeah, again, very different than our plague. Immune systems were shot as is, and you're telling me a plague rolled through while we're in trenches? No way, what a nightmare. But just like that, the virus disappeared. Better treatment, perhaps it mutated into a much weaker strain. Either way, Great, stay gone, get out of here. Go away and stay there, pal. Hit that thumbs up for the Spanish flu not being around. Awesome, we love that. It's a good one to not have. Number eight, the great dying. This name's pretty accurate, if I'm being honest myself. Scariest environment imaginable. Here we go. Turning the clocks and solar system back 252 million years ago, the Permian Triassic extinction, which for convenience sake we'll call the great dying, was and hopefully shall remain the largest extinction event on earth. The fact that we're even alive right now, watching this video, clicking that thumbs up and subscribing, well, it's all pretty rare, all things considered. This was a butterfly effect triggered by a massive volcanic eruption around the Serbian traps in Russia. A runaway greenhouse effect was responsible for the loss of 95% of all marine life and 70% of all land animals. That's so everything pretty much. Pretty much everything's gone. Temperatures rose as the sea began to absorb large quantities of CO2 from the atmosphere. Mentioned that a little earlier and that could not be great. And it began turning into carbonic acid, hence all that marine life that didn't make it. Methane hydrate then started to bubble from the ocean surface which is horrifying to imagine, and it raised the temperature even higher at that point. Now, imagine if this didn't happen. We'd have those scary sharks still swimming around. We're remnants of the surviving 4% of the great dying. Yeah, to all your friends that. I'm gonna add that to my LinkedIn. That sounds not half bad. Yeah, I survived the great dying, so yeah. Really good at scooping ice cream. Let's do it. Number seven, Maximilien Robespierre. On July 27th, 1794, French revolutionary Maximilien Robespierre and 21 of his followers were all arrested at the Hotel de Ville in Paris. Now, considering that this was 1794 and we got arrested, what follows is sure to be a public nightmare. The next day, Robespierre and again, 21 of his followers were all taken to the Palace de Revolution where they were all executed by guillotine before a cheering crowd. Always a cheering crowd, of course. What, are, what else are we doing today? Let's go watch. What history tends to leave out of this part is that Maximilian tempted to take his own life beforehand because he knew his fate was gonna suck with the whole, you know, thing. But when he tried to take his own life, he survived and was left instead with a nasty jaw wound. So in Game of Thrones fashion, the executioner, when the time came, ripped the jaw bandage off first and then he saw the guillotine. Yeah, again, to a cheering crowd, remember? They all watched this, all this unfold. I can't even watch UFC sometimes. You're telling me people watch this? IRL? That's, I'm gonna go throw up real quick. Be right back. Number six, the eruption. Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines, was another volcanic eruption that shook up history. A little more recent than the other one. This was on June 15th, 1991. Mount Pinatubo, this massive volcano, erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Impressive? Yes. Terrifying, absolutely. Yep, this is very loud and scary. Activity in the volcano 
first started on April 2nd, 1991. And these things take a little time to, you know, finish up. So that same year, researchers set up seismographs in the area, and by June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions. And then on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent hot ash 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere, which then rained on down to everything around it, which is the worst thing I can imagine. Additional smaller eruptions continued on June 13th, which then led to some intense seismic activity. And then on June 15th, the volcano once again went off, this time sending a cloud of ash 40 kilometers into the atmosphere. So bye bye sun for a little bit. This one's gonna linger. Number five, the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the, well, clearly the very excited Challenger crew right before when they were walking down the ramp, ready to head off on their mission. Now this photo is chilling, but it's nice to see them happy and together. The crew even included at the time, 37 year old Kristen McAuliffe, who was a high school social studies teacher. You may remember this, but your parents definitely do. So she had won a spot on the mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space Program. Program. And she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first ever non-military individual in space. On January 28th, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fateful just 73 seconds after liftoff. See, two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures that morning, and on live television, the world had to watch as a spacecraft broke apart and then fell into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everybody on board the craft. Now, I'm not sure if you've watched the documentary on Netflix, but it's a mini-series about this whole Thing and it's powerful stuff. It's really emotional. I just finished it and it's moving. Number four, the core. <clears throat> this photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew. And while this photo looks relatively normal and scientific or whatever, a non-threatening photo, what he has in his hands is truly devastating. It changed history. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man. Yeah, that thing. This means that Harold is now holding the nuclear core of the atomic weapon that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast took many, many lives, as well as the long-term effects of radiation illnesses. Now, it's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems so perfectly normal when he literally has a life-changing, world-ending device in the palm of his hand, like a literal supervillain holding kryptonite. I couldn't imagine seeing that, let alone holding it. No way. My grandmother wouldn't even hold me as a baby because I was too small and fragile. <laughs> Think she'd hold this? No way. Butterfingers. Butterfingers galore over there. Number three, the ball of burning men. January 28th, 1393. You are formal invited to a masquerade ball. How fun is that? <laughs> Who is it under that mask? Oh, it's just Taylor on Bumblebee. Love him. He's great. The French queen Isabeau of Bavaria is now hosting one of the most lavish parties of the decade, right? So bring your finest and longest crook house. Roll it in style. Now, when the French royal court was celebrating the marriage of one of the queen's ladies in waiting, it of course was a big deal. It's fun. It's a big happy day. For some, the best days of their lives. For others at this ball, not so great. Probably the last days of their lives. King Charles Charles VI had five companions perform a dance or a theater routine of sorts. Now they did a performance as beasts. They were committed to the bin, right? They had these big, lovely masks, big baggy outfits, lots of linen, lots of stuffing to appear as if they were real beasts. Now the party was going well, wine was spilling, people were laughing, beasts were roaring, we were committed, but one rule beforehand was put into place before the party started. Absolutely, positively, no open flames. Obviously, right? I mean, look at that guy. He looks like a couch. We're not gonna put a match near him. It's gonna be chaos. The Duke of Orleans had a little too much fun prior to this event, and he forgot the first rule of Fight Club when he arrived. The guy walked in with a lit torch. He wanted to see everyone. Some accounts say he dropped the torch by accident. Others say he got too close trying to guess the identity of said beasts. Either way, this tragic event took the lives of four people, hence the name, Ball of the Burning Men. That's terrible, imagine that, what a gig. Number two, Stanford Prison Experiment. One of the most well-known experiments of all time was the Stanford Prison Experiment. It was an attempt to investigate the psychological effects of perceived power, and it worked. A little too well, I'd say. Guards and prisoners were all chosen randomly from college students to anyone, your neighbor, you had no idea. Nobody really knew just how bad this experiment would end up, so anyone volunteered. Those in power were taking it to an extreme level. It was absolute psychological distress. Some of the prisoners went insane. The whole exercise was abandoned after only six days, which is not a short amount of time, but historians say just six days because it was intended to last much longer. Now, it's shocking to see the lengths people go after receiving power over another human being. I thought I was evil unplugging my brother's controller and like playing, you know, and he wasn't plugged in. This is like 
Next level. And finally, number one, mummified pets. Are you a pet owner? If so, comment down below which animals fill your house. We love that. Olivia and I want to get a dog so bad. I was always a dog guy growing up. My aunt had three pugs. It was the dream. I love it. Ancient Egyptians, they fancied a house pet or two. We know this. But Egyptians saw animals as incarnations of the gods, which I do too with my shih tzu, of course. The very concept of having a pet came from ancient Egyptians, so thank you. Egyptians were, of course, fans of cats. That's common knowledge at this point. But did you know they also had the same idea for hawks, lions, dogs, and baboons? Yeah, baboons. That's amazing. Go ask your parents for a baboon as a pet. There you go. I thought dogs doing their business inside was annoying, but a lion? Your arm's gonna be tired scooping that one up. Many of these animals were often mummified and buried with their owners after they had passed, just like how many owners today cremate their pets. I mean, I'm not sure I would mummify a shih tzu, but hey, whatever floats your boat, who am I to judge? Other creatures were specially trained to work as helper animals back then. So ancient Egyptian police officers would use dogs and monkeys to help patrolling, then they'd mummify them. What a time, imagine that. Eating with the rich starts off the countdown at number 10. Medieval recipes depict a large variety of animals being served. Adding to the ones I listed previously are horses, lampreys, cranes, and crows. Hell, even beavers. And let's not forget the animals created by their chefs. One homemade animal was called a cock and trice, and it was actually multiple animals' bodies put together before being roasted. A helmeted cock was another chef creation. It was a roasted chicken wearing a tiny helmet that was sat on the back of a roasted pig because why not? Dinner in a show is always fun, so in late medieval Europe, it became fashionable to have an etrometta, which was an entertainment dish. One such example is bakers cooked a pie shell in advance, and then after it cooled, they placed live birds inside the pie and resealed it. When cut at the table, the birds would then all fly out of the pie, much to the amazement of the many banquet guests, assuming that all went accordingly. FIFA fans may want to skip out on this next one, because number nine in our countdown is making football illegal. That's right, while I may be referring to it as primarily soccer in this video, what was still called football at the time was made illegal in the medieval ages. Now there are quite a few reasons for this. Most popularly known is that the sport was extremely different then. It was violent and aggressive, resembling more of a mass brawl with minimal rules. However, it was also because only two years after soccer was banned in 1363, King Edward III would implement a mandatory archery education law. This would ensure his villagers could be used as soldiers should need be. King Edward believed that soccer, but also sports in general such as handball, football, hockey, and cockfighting were distractions and at that time they could be doing better things. I'm sure there are many of you that would disagree. Next on the countdown is number 8, the future predicting friar. There's a lot to unpack here so I'll just jump right in. English Franciscan monk Roger Bacon is known through history for his shockingly accurate predictions of the future transportation and life that we have now. Bacon lived from 1214 until 1292 and was the successful creator of the magnifying glass. But he also famously predict future machinery in his book Espetola de Secretis Opribus, if I got that right. Cars can be made so that without animals, people will move unbelievably rapid. And flying machines can be constructed so that a man sits in the midst of a machine, revolving some engines by which artificial wings are made to beat in the air like a flying bird. It's a little nonsensical, but you can see what he's implying. His other predictions included steamships, submarines, diving suits, and telescopes. That's pretty spot on for a guy who lived thousands of years ago. This is the same man who was also said to have sculpted a prophetic head of brass. Apparently having been warned by a spirit that he must listen to whenever the head first spoke, Bacon set his assistant Miles to watch over the sculpture, which he did even past Bacon's demise. It's said that after the friar's death, however, that was the first time it spoke. First saying, Time is. Then, time passed. Ignored both times by a confused mile, the head spoke only once more to say time is past before it exploded into flames. And so the chance to consult the mysterious head was lost when it combust. What do you think of the legendary Bacon and his stories of mysticism? Time is past, as the sculpted head said. So let's be happy we left this weird tradition in the past. In at number seven in the countdown, it's the medieval animal trials. Under the ruler's power, there was no exception to medieval law. 
And so it should come as no surprise that even animals could face the brunt of their alleged crimes. This was no casual affair. The rich and the poor gathered for these trials as spectators. Some of the accused animals were even dressed in wigs and gloves, fancy garments to be seen in front of the royal court as their fate was debated by the lawmakers. That should come as no surprise either, seeing as the medieval era wasn't exactly overflowing with entertainment outlets. There are records of at least 85 animal trials that had taken place during medieval slash middle ages. And while the most serious offenders were pigs by a landslide, there are records of some roosters and even one donkey facing the judge. What were these animals being charged for, you may be asking? Many times it was the act of attacking or eating humans, as food and grain for animals was so sparse they'd often go hungry. There were also some accused of being heathens or thieves or behaving in lustuous ways. So make sure you have a walking buddy and always look over your shoulder because I guess you never know when an ill-attentioned cow may be creeping up on you. Number six in the countdown is the St. Scholastica Day Riot. February 10th of 1355, a group of students who attended Oxford University decide to go into town for a pint at the Swindlestock Tavern. Little did they or anyone else know that this would be the start of a notoriously famous riot. It started with belligerent complaints to the tavern owner about the quality of their drinks and service. As the tavern owner was progressively more berated, he and other patrons lost their temper with these students. The escalation led to a verbal sparring between the students and bar patrons. Both sides ended up arming themselves, but luckily, things were quickly interrupted when the mayor stepped in and demanded the arrest of the students who had harassed and assaulted the tavern owner, thus sparking this whole disaster. What should have been a peaceful resolution caused a chain reaction, however. Oxford students rose up in protest of their peers' arrest and swarmed to attack the mayor. News of that quickly spread and the townsfolk revolted immediately. Many of them were already very tired of these students and their entitled complex and had been waiting for the opportunity to rage against them. The riot that occurred ended the lives of 63 students and 30 locals. While the case's investigation led to Oxford winning against the town in court, the Oxford Council was still made to parade shamefully through the village every year on February 10th and they did have to pay a fine to the families of each student lost. For number five, we're getting a little spicy with Risqué's men's clothing. Now, you may have already heard stories or seen memes about ridiculously long pointed shoes and groin flattering armor, but did you know that provocative men's clothing was all the rage for a period of time in the medieval era. It's recorded that in the late 14th century, men were quite keen to be seen in overtly short tunics and thin tights. By 1463, a modesty statute had to be passed as men had upgraded to wearing cod pieces publicly, which did cover their mostly exposed genitals, but only by making them look cartoonishly large and bulbous in the process. A similar escapade happened with the Krakow shoe. These long, pointy-ended shoes were sometimes so so long that they had to be tied back around the wearer's ankles or reinforced inside with a whalebone. The same statute in 1463 also addressed limiting these Krakow shoes for those reasons. Seems like there may be a little bit of a compensation theme here. Both provocative dressing and shoe length were limited to those of extreme wealth after the statute passed, but that didn't stop the development of some more outlandish beauty standards. For example, number four in our countdown is Plucked Bear. Nowadays, whether you're scrolling through an app or walking down the road, you're likely to see advertisements for eyelashes and hair accentuation services. And while that may be pretty trendy and normal to us, now, in the medieval ages, having hair on your face would have actually made you stand out in a crowd. Women would remove their eyebrows, eyelashes, even significantly reduce their hairline so as to achieve a smooth egg-like effect. This was because the forehead was considered the center point of the face for many years, and so it would make sense to remove anything on or around it so as to accentuate it, right? Maybe. Moving on. If you're tired of her plucking herself bald, and she's tired of you wearing shoes that enter a room before you do, then maybe it's time for a good old fashioned medieval divorce by combat. That's right, you heard me. Coming in at number three is divorce by combat. This finding was discovered in historic German manuscript that laid out rules as to how divorce by combat was to proceed. Their decision to use combat as a means of, to solution was not unusual for medieval Germany, as trial by combat was part of their law system. Trial by combat was legally sanctioned duel that ensured whomever was to win the fight was deemed 
right. There are many ways that these duels could be fought and various weapons and locations in which to have them. The divorce by combat trial was placed when a man was put into a three foot deep hole with one hand tied behind his back. The woman, however, would have a normal ground and be able to move freely. This was believed to ensure a fair fight between the sexes. Now there is some evidence that the outcome of these trials could still end in death even if the death was not as a result of the combat. It's said that if the man lost to his wife, he would be taken from his hole and executed in the town square. If the woman lost, she would be then placed in the hole and then buried alive. So yeah, I'd say maybe try talking it out a little bit first before resorting to a public throwdown that can end in death. And while we're on the topic of trials, number two on the countdown is trials of the dead. Who would have such a vendetta with the dead that they would have them unburied to stand a trial? Well, new Pope Stephen, that's who. In 897, the months old body of Pope Formorpheus, the first pope to ever be executed, was extracted from his grave to serve trial for his alleged absurping of papacy. The new pope donned the corpse in elaborate robes and even assigned a deacon for defense. You may be wondering why the new Pope Stephen had done this to his predecessor. Since a holy person's body was considered to become a holy relic in death, it became a holy right to display their corpse in public tombs or churches so petitioners may still visit their former saint to leave tokens or deliver prayer. What better way to ensure that you have devoted attention of the community than a postpartum smear campaign where your opponent can't defend themselves because, well, they're dead. Stephen found the deceased Pope from Morpheus guilty so that he could toss his body into the Tiber River, as nobody can venerate his relic if his body is lost at sea. That's a pretty intense way to usurp the person who had the job before you. Jokes on Stephen, however, as shortly after this trial, he was executed just like his predecessor, making him once again come in second to Formorpheus. Call it karma. With that dose of crazy, we can move on to Medieval Madness, which ranks at number one in our countdown. What was the Medieval Madness? Well, if you're a fan of rye bread, you may not want to listen in on this. In an era without refrigeration systems, as well as poor hygiene, produce was left to natural elements. As a result, mold and bacteria growth was common and would, of course, migrate into food. Ergot mold is the most well known for its effect on the brain. It caused wild hallucinations and extreme emotional changes as the chemicals in your brain became imbalanced. The consumption of this mold and bacteria has had a variety of exclusively unpleasant side effects, such as vomiting, diarrhea, convulsions, delayed visions, even mania and psychosis. These symptoms make it obvious as to why this could be labeled as a madness. The extreme cases of ergot consumption would of course lead to things such as loss of limb, gangrene, or death. And this connection between molding rye flour and ergot poisoning wouldn't be made until 1670. So for hundreds of years beforehand, commoners saw ergot poisoning to be things like demonic possession. Many theorize and connect the medieval madness to that of the time periods of the witch trials. The trials began in 1691 a year of intensive wet and cold, which produces a higher level of ergot. They ended abruptly in 1693, a year said to be sparse on rye grain. If there's less to consume, there's less ability to be poisoned, making it arguable that there could be a connection between the two, especially as a side effect of ergot poisoning could be mistaken as demonic possession, as previously mentioned. And that is also seen as a symptom of witchcraft. Still, this may not be the kind of bread you want to chase. Number 10, an apple a day. If you threw an apple at somebody today, that would be assault. Yeah, you're not allowed to do that. You can't huck food at people now, then, ever. Let's just not do that anymore. But in ancient Greek days, it was a little different, dare I say. The apple, back then, had quite the symbolism attached to it. The apple was sacred to Aphrodite. This was a symbol for the goddess of love. So, to throw an apple at somebody, that meant you were throwing your heart at them, right? How romantic is that? Just a nice apple with bugs in it. You're like, here you go, there's lunch. Ancient flirting, my friend the more you know. Maybe those trees in the Wizard of Oz weren't mean. Maybe they weren't mean at all. Maybe they were just trying to express their love by throwing apples aggressively at everyone involved. Number nine, raining iguanas. Okay, we're immediately dipping back into the weird side of this list. Here we go. Back in 2018, this was wild. I read about this and I'll never forget. Lives rent free right in my head. Florida got another odd headline. There you go, classic Florida. This time it was frozen iguanas falling from the skies. Yeah, how do you not pick up that paper, right? Florida got hit with a 
massive snowfall, their first big one in 28 years. So these cold-blooded guys started to fall from suburban tree branches, right? They didn't see it coming at all. People were just walking to get groceries and iguanas are freezing and falling off trees right in front of them. The craziest thing is that they're just paralyzed. They're not dead, obviously. So later, they would come back to life after they, you know, de-thaw. Sounds so zombie-like when you say it like that. They're just lying there and then all of a sudden they're like, <gasps> what day is it? Was it a snowfall? Oh God, winter has come. Number eight, the Philadelphia Experiment. Okay, a little more darker, let's do it. Perhaps one of the most bizarre tales when it comes to other dimensions, this one has credibility behind it. It pops up on my Reddit feed a lot, so I can't help but not talk about it. The 1943 Philadelphia Experiment. This World War II conspiracy theory takes place on the USS Eldridge, this destroyer class ship. So it wasn't small, it was quite large. A lot of people on board, a lot of heads, a lot of witnesses. And they were conducting on this ship these secret experiments in order to gain power over naval warfare, obviously at the time. Now one of these experiments was to create this technology that makes the ship invisible on radar. That's the important note. It was supposed to be invisible on radar. But when the generators were fired up, the hull apparently lit up with this green and blue light, then the ship itself actually disappeared. Invisible in real life, not just on radar. Boom, gone, just like that. It was then seen at a naval shipyard in Virginia before the same thing happened again, and then it appeared back in Philadelphia. Now this sounds a bit intense, but when you hear about the crew on board, it only gets worse. Some went mad after the dimensional dip, of course, while others had physical effects from this cosmic commute. Yeah, some haunting details in that one, some body parts that got mixed up with, yeah, I can't even talk about it. You get it. If you've seen the Cloverfield Paradox, it's kind of like that. Some, some blooping and blipping, and then some arms getting stuck in some walls. There we go. Number seven, Ellen Shannon. Heading over to the late 1800s for this one. I gotta warn you, it's of course pretty dark. In 1870, we obviously didn't have the same safety requirements as we do today for anything, like, at all. For example, if you wanted to read before bed, you didn't have a Kindle or an iPad. Hell, you didn't even have a nightlight, but you did have a kerosene lamp. Always coming in handy, those kerosene lamps. See, Ellen had used R.E. Danforther's non-reactive burning fluid. And dare I say, the obvious happened. The fluid reacted. Yeah, her tomb in Pennsylvania reads, in memory of Ellen Shannon, aged 26 years old, who was fatally burned March 21st, 1870, by the reaction of a lamp filled with R.E. Danforther's non-reactive burning fluid. Yeah, they just called him out right there, right in public on the actual tomb. I gotta say, I agree with that, that's cool. If some idiot's gonna cause your horrible demise, yeah, roast them, let people know. Let people know who's responsible. That's like Twitter nowadays, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, just so-and-so is an asshole. Send tweet. That's there forever. Number six, military dolphins. Yep, I said military dolphins. Here we are, we're almost halfway through our list. We'll get a little more weird now. Iran has plenty of nuclear capabilities, but they also have trained dolphins now too, so. Huh. Good game, folks. Back in 2000, Iran bought this fleet of trained dolphins from Russia. Just Russians doing things. But they were trained, supposedly by the Soviet Union, to attack ships, and yes, you guessed it, attack people. We have Navy SEALs and military dolphins. Is this Aquaman 2? What's happening right now? Well, recently, and I mean that as in 2018 recent, satellite photos revealed a Russian naval base in Syria with pens that are commonly used for holding Dolphins. Yeah, so these dolphins are active, perhaps, right now. That's so terrifying. Russia and the US have a fleet of trained dolphins to detect mines, but now Iran is also in the mix as well. So, three powers in the dolphin game. What an odd standoff that would be in the water. They're all eating at each other. Number five, Abel and Baker. Okay, we often remember Laika the space dog and her 103 minute cosmic journey aboard Sputnik 2. But does anybody remember Abel and Baker? Why don't we talk about these two enough? This was the American version of Laika. This was less than two years right after that. It was May 28th, 1959. The United States launched two female primates. They launched Abel and Baker into space. This mission only lasted 15 minutes and they both safely returned back home. That's wild to me. The monkeys weren't injured from the cosmic commute at all. A radio message came in shortly right after they splashed down in the Atlantic and the message said, no injuries or other difficulties. Thank the Lord, we love that. Abel and Baker, perfect, as they said. I don't think we can blast any more primates into space going 10,000 miles an hour anymore, but it's wild to me that we did this ever. This is insane. A human had to strap in a chimp into a rocket ship and be like, all right, see ya, and then, 
That's insane. Grown adults had to do that. That's insane. Abel sadly passed away shortly after the flight. Nothing to do with the actual flight itself, just timing. Meanwhile, Baker, she got famous. She was getting 150 fan letters a day. Imagine if she had Twitter. Oh, be wild. These ladies are icons. Never mind Laka, okay? Hit that thumbs up for Abel and then subscribe for Baker. They went in space. That's crazy. Number four, asteroid redirection. Speaking of space, this one has Michael Bay written all over it. I can't wait. I'm pretty excited for this project. I can't even catch a baseball with my hands. You're telling me NASA is gonna catch an asteroid hurling through space? This is the future. We've arrived. NASA landing on an asteroid is one thing. Sure, that's, you know, a Michael Bay movie. But their asteroid redirection mission, that's a whole nother level. This coming Monday, as in like four days from now, I don't know, NASA is gonna broadcast its first attempt to modify the orbit of an asteroid hurling through space. This is real life. And before you start to panic, no, there's no way any debris can hit the Earth after said test. But if an asteroid was coming for Earth, well, now we have a backup plan to hopefully, ideally, save the human race and the planet. That would be helpful. That's always handy. The planetary defense team is using a craft called DART, just sending a, sending a DART out there. You got a dart? Awesome. Double asteroid redirection test, dart, which will ideally target the asteroid Dimorphos and then altering its orbit. And we can tune in live to watch the whole thing on Monday, because that's where we're at in the future. We can just tune in live and watch Jake Paul fight someone or watch an asteroid get blasted off of its course. How are you spending your afternoon this Monday? Number three, mass extinctions. Are we part of the sixth extinction? I mean, we're talking about asteroids getting blasted away from Earth. It kind of feels like it. It kind of feels like something's nearing us. It's happening right now, isn't it? We lose thousands of species every year. And when looking in the past, sure, asteroids and ice ages, they've all caused these massive extinction level events, of course. But after humans invented the wheel and discovered fire and, you know, became the worst things ever to exist, things started to change naturally. In the 1800s, industrialization drove up extinction rates and continues to do so, obviously. We're not helping the planet by any means. And according to Elizabeth Colbert, across the world, scientists every day are monitoring what could be the largest extinction event since the dinosaurs. Right now. It's happening right now. The way human beings interact with the environment and affect biodiversity, it could be more deadly than an asteroid hitting the Earth. That's a, that's a fun, scary fact. Okay. With an ever-climbing list of endangered species, Colbert and the world ask the question, is it too late to change it? Kind of feels like it's too late. Okay, let's move on to something a little more lighter so we don't feel like complete trash. Deal? Deal. Number two, re-laxative. Okay, so right off the bat, the Victorian era was a little messy. I'm sure you've figured this out by now, but these messy illnesses were putting a lot of pressure on medical practitioners back in the Victorian day, so they were desperate for new treatments. Sometimes I laugh at Victorian medical treatments, but they tried. And they also achieved many medical breakthroughs, one that I saved for number one. But when it came to handling chicken pox in the Victorian era, that wasn't our finest hour. No, we didn't figure that one out, I don't think, right off the bat. Chicken pox in the Victorian era was being treated by using laxatives. Yeah, just let that sink in for a second. I have chicken pox. What should I do, doc? Eh, just go take a sh or six. I don't know, it might help. Yeah, folks would slam some castor oil and then, ready for this? They would get even more sick. Yeah, who would have thought, right? You thought you were uncomfortable before. Well, <laughs> not even close. Not every answer was a solution in the Victorian era. But this one was. And finally, number one, the discovery of penicillin. Thank God this one happened. This was, we'll still talk about this one because it's a really good one. Sometimes miracles happen when nobody is in the room or no one's looking. That's ideally the best time. Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin back in 1928. Now at the time, he was actually studying Staphylococcus, which is bacteria that causes infections and boils and all that nasty stuff. But right before Alexander left for a well-earned two-week vacation, he left a Petri dish with some of that Staphylococcus right there on the table, just sitting there. Rather than, you know, store it away in an incubator, he just accidentally left it out. Now during this time off, a penicillium mold, the spore just drifted in there, either through a window or up the lab stairwell, some Horton here's a who type commute. It drifted in there and the temperatures of the room and the lack of one Alexander Fleming allowed for the mold to fight back. And then miracles literally happened. It then prevented that bacteria from growing anymore. So he returned and discovered this antibacterial substance was only produced by strains of penicillium. So now we have a solution that isn't a laxative. You know what I mean? Now we have some things that help us out medicinally. Yeah, we got asteroids, some medicines, some, some horrible history, some dark, 
dark tragic events, we got it all in this list really, I don't know how to tell you that. Kicking off the list at number 10, the first zoo. Long before the pyramids were even built, Egyptians were getting quite creative. They were the first to see a petting zoo. How brave is that, if anything? Yeah, let's just start touching animals and then see what happens. Let's do it. 6,000 years ago, Hierakonopolis was the capital of Upper Egypt during the pre-dynastic period. It was beautiful. It was sitting alongside the Nile River, which was even more beautiful back then, you can't even imagine. And in those days, perhaps the best way to flaunt your wealth was by getting an exotic pet. Yeah, the old Mike Tyson trick. There were excavations done back in the late 19th century by English archeologists James Quibble and Frederick Green, and they discovered that this town was once thriving with over 10,000 residents. It's a lot of people. It's a lot more people than we ever thought. That alone is amazing. That's a historical feat. But when further studies were performed, they also found the remains of an elephant surrounded in cosmetics, surrounded in ivory bracelets and amethyst beads, the whole glorious, you name it, a worshiped elephant. That's odd. Then they found the remains of cats and dogs, also worshipped. The dogs, slightly more worshipped. Common pets, some crocodiles. Again, brave owners there. There's also hippos, leopards, wild ox. It was a wild time. They were carefully buried, but the broken bones suggested a cruel history sometimes. But most of the times, they were pets. Not as bad as we thought there. I'm like, oh, ancient pets? No, they're good. A lot of ivory. Number nine. King Tut's passing. Perhaps one of the greatest mysteries is of course the history of the young King Tut. Younger than we remember, honestly. The young boy became pharaoh at just age nine in 1332 BC. Yeah, what were you doing at age nine? I was mini golfing, maybe, I don't even know. During his time ruling, the young king had to face a country in conflict. Egypt and Nubia at this point were going head to head over land, and not even 10 years into ruling, the young pharaoh passed away at age 18. It wasn't until 1922 until he was ever seen again. That's when Howard Carter, of course, discovered the tomb of the lost king, appropriately in the Valley of the Kings. This is where we could have been more careful, you know, historically, because when Tut was discovered, they tried to move his body out of the oil that coated the coffin. But in doing so, they got a little bit too excited. They didn't really know what they were doing back then, so they damaged him. Yeah, they damaged an ancient king. How brutal is that? So now it's next to impossible to tell what really took his life at such an early age, especially for a king. We have some ideas though. It's not entirely hopeless at this point. It was believed King Tut, after some 3D scans were done, had a broken leg. So he may have fallen off a chariot or something. So if King Tut passed at an early age out of nowhere, hopefully this was the reason why or else there's another mystery afoot. Number eight, the first peace treaty. The first peace treaty in history ever was back in 1259 BC. Now at this point, ancient Egyptians and the Hittite Empire were fighting over what's now modern day Syria. This conflict had been lasting for centuries. And finally, come 1274 BC, the Battle of Kadesh was now underway. Of course, there was tons of bloodshed, no clear victor in sight. So what's left to do at this point? For the first time ever, a peace treaty was agreed upon. Ramses II and King Hadassuli III both negotiated a peace treaty where both sides would aid each other if perhaps a third party decided to get involved. Involved. They saw their resources, they saw that they were lacking on both sides, so like, hey, we have no we have no shot really, let's just team up. A copy of the treaty can now be found in New York above the entrance to the United Nations Security Council chamber. It's also in the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest peace treaty ever. That's how you know it's official, if you don't believe me. Every 90s kid watching right now is like, oh, really? Amen. That's a fact, that's a true fact right there, those holographic covers. What a trip. Number seven, board games. I love board games a lot, even Monopoly. I have the patience for it every now and then. But ancient Egyptians, huh, talk about patience, my friends. They also loved board games. They created them. They got that board, kind of time. Dogs and Jackals, Mehen and Sinet, and 20 Squares, those are the classics. Mehen was played during the pre-dynastic period, around 2500 BC. Now the goal was to reach the center of the spiral, so we think we're trying to piece it together. The board was a coiled snake almost, pretty creative. Senate was the most popular game of all time. Queen and kings alike would play this one. Senate had a long board with 30 squares painted on it. Now of course the rules are still unknown, still heavily debated, just like Monopoly even today. But we have some ideas how Egyptians played it. Three rows of 10 squares, the last five are decorated, so it's assumed, like everything else in ancient Egypt, that this was themed on the afterlife. Plus, King Tut was buried with one of these boards. I'm gonna be buried with a GameCube or something like that. There's also some paintings of Queen Nefertiti playing Senate, so that's how you know it's a good one. It looks a lot like chess. Imagine playing a pharaoh in chess. God, I'd be so anxious. I'd be so nerve-wracking. I wouldn't even play checkers with a pharaoh. 
That'd be too scary. I'm bad at checkers and chess. I don't know how to play chess. I'm lying to you guys. I've never played chess. I don't know how to. Number six, Akhenaten Amun. This queen was ruling during the 18th dynasty of Egypt. The pharaoh Akhenaten, well, this was his daughter. She followed in her father's footsteps and was a great ruler, but she was also the wife and half-brother of one King Tut. A pretty conflicted spot to be in, historically. Her and King Tut had the same father, but their mothers were different. Now, after Tut's death, however, it's believed this queen may have married the pharaoh Ai shortly after, and perhaps she's buried near him right now in the Valley of the Kings. Back in 2010, DNA testing was being done in tomb KB21, and there were two 18th dynasty queens that were recovered from that tomb in the Valley of the Kings. Could it be, perhaps? There wasn't enough data that was found from the mummy, but they do know that the DNA is somewhat of an 18th dynasty royal bloodline, so we're definitely close. In another tomb, tomb KB63, numerous coffins were found, and one had an imprint of a woman on it, along with jewelry, women's clothing at the time, but the biggest clue really at this point was pottery fragments. Of course, it's always in the pottery. We've all played Ogre enough time, always check the pots. The name Paten was on one of these pottery fragments. That's another clue. The only person to ever use this name historically was the long lost queen, of Akhenasunamun. So now we're getting real close. Dangerously close. But it feels weird to watch so many tombs be opened up at this point. Like, yeah, we're getting close to finding out things historically, but can we just leave these leading ladies alone? I feel like they dealt with enough men in their lifetime. Now we're just like, Boof. we're like, hey, is that her? Nope, we're good. It's like, eh. Let them rest. They have fake doors. They don't want us coming in. Number five, Queen Nefertiti's disappearance. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336 BC, Queen Nefertiti, aka Lady of Grace, aka Hereditary Princess, was born in 1370 BC. She was born in the Egyptian city of Thebes. She was only 15 years old when she married 16-year-old Akhenaten. Again, always so young and just forced this family forced fun. She worshiped the sun god Aten at the time, and alongside her young husband, she built a new capital called Armana. She even created a new religion. She was onto some good stuff. She ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in Egyptian history. Nefertiti had six children, which were all daughters. Many believe this has something to do with her disappearance. After reconstructing Egypt's religious and political structure, soaring to new heights as a woman in the Egyptian court, the queen just vanished. Yeah, historically, just like that, boom. During the 12th year of the 17 that her husband ruled for, historical records seem to have just wiped out the queen's side of the legacy. She was gone from everything, and many believe that she didn't actually die, but rather, she disguised herself and continued to rule. See, the next in line after Akhenaten's reign was Pharaoh Smenkeher. Was that really enough for Titi in disguise? I hope so. That's like some she's the man stuff right there. The reason we believe she may have disguised herself as a man is because of the female pharaoh, Hapshaput. She ruled with a fake beard in the 15th century, so it's possible, we've seen it. And lastly, there's a theory that the reason Nefertiti was banished was because she couldn't produce a male hair. Like I mentioned, she had six daughters and then she disappeared. This is, this is ancient history we're talking about. Always brutal, no matter what. Beautiful, but brutal. Number four, Cleopatra's. Sure, she may have been born in Egypt, but Cleopatra, despite what many believe, was not Egyptian. She was the last Greek ruler of Egypt, and after Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, Ptolemy then took over Egypt, which in turn launched this wave, this dynasty of Greek rulers that lasted for centuries. DNA-wise, she was barely Egyptian, but as she grew up, she was determined to learn all about Egyptian culture. And due to political structure, she started to style herself after the god Goddess Isis. She was the first Cleopatra that claimed to be Isis after the third Cleopatra. Yeah, there's way more than we think. It's like seven. Number three, King Ramses VIII. The last son of Ramses III. He's the seventh pharaoh of the 20th dynasty. King Ramses VIII. Yeah, history is confusing with these numbers sometimes. I gotta tell you, I had to type that one out a few times. I was like eight, third, carry the eight, nine, Ramses what? The lost king had the throne for a very short amount of time and historians are trying to understand why that is. What exactly happened? When the King Joffrey went wrong with King Ramses VIII here, he was the only pharaoh of the 20th dynasty whose tomb is still lost in the Valley of the Kings. So maybe it's not even there. And the thing is, with his ruling being so short, the theory out there is that the tomb of KB19 that belonged to the son of Ramses IX, many believe this tomb was originally built for Ramses VIII. But once he became king, everybody saw his true colors. They must have changed their mind at that point or changed their lane or something. They were like, eh, uh, maybe not him, you know? There is a confirmed tomb that was never used for Ramses VIII, and that was tomb QB43. That was in the Valley of the Queens. It was made for him, but never used. Again, more mysteries. Oh, the poor souls who had to build all these tombs, and they're like, you don't need it? Okay. 57 years to make that tomb. You sure you don't need it? Okay. Number two. Baboon police. Ancient Egyptians worshipped lots of animals. We mentioned that earlier. They had zoos and elephants surrounded in ivory, all that good stuff. At one point or another, you've heard about how cats were highly respected back then, worshipped. But they also worshipped other animals as well. 
Sorry, cat people. The other animals are fun, like baboons, believe it or not. They were pretty important pieces to this ancient Egyptian puzzle. Egyptians had tattoos of baboons all over them. This was before Harambe, you know? Anyone monumental like that ever came around. The most famous piece of history that we have preserved is in the collections of the British Museum in London. There's a mummy on display, and it looks a little slightly different than the rest. EA6736, fun name, but he was recovered from the Temple of Cones in Luxor, Egypt. This little man dates back to the New Kingdom period, so anywhere around 1550 BC, to 10 BC. Yeah, he's quite old. Baboons would appear in art and religion all over ancient Egypt, and one of my favorite facts ever has to be that in ancient Egyptian times, pharaohs would train baboons to make arrests. Yeah, imagine stealing food and trying to run away, and then you look back and there's four baboons doing parkour behind you, telling you to stop resisting, hucking bananas at you. That's crazy. And number one, false doors. Imagine searching for a lost Egyptian tomb your entire life, all right? Imagine you spent years of your life dedicating everything to this research, and you finally find this door, this ancient door, you find an entrance carved into the wall. This is it. What lies beyond? You try and carefully open it with a team of archaeologists, but it won't budge because it is a fake door, my friends. It is a false door. Yeah, you just got juked out from a guy 4,500 years ago. He's like, gotcha. <sighs> Took long, we did it. False doors in ancient Egyptian tombs are very common. Ancient Egyptians believed that these false doors were a connection to the dead. How beautiful is that? And that is how spirits were able to travel from here to there, and back and forth. See, most false doors can be found on the west wall because Egyptians believed the west to be the land of the dead. The west, that's the west. Which way? Which way is north? Your west, my east. How does that sound? There we go. Number 10, the Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like, you're already the first, man. You don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay. And five on that phone plan. <sighs> Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. Number nine, the Crusades. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three-part miniseries spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in six million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the east. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings, the elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, 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 we need fear way more fear. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year is 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers and the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right that down. Except women, they don't have laws. And they can't act in plays. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? That's right, animals. Being tried in a court. A lively and popular event trying any law-breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathers, were pecked the floor, yes or no? Objection, your honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. Number seven, the Battle of Bannockburn. This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and roll our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. 
not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death, aka pestilence, aka the great mortality, or simply known as the plague. Single-handedly the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where bless you comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. Uh, I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food. Should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead, but those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the Black Death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number five, Joan of Arc. Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages. Who'd have thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard in my entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number four, Henry V. Another war? All these people do is kill each other. Doesn't anyone fish? Or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars and at his heels, Leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment. Henry V, prologue. Good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card. Just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer. Town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town, and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh uh, yeah, I play uh, mob football at Oxford. <sighs> yeah, I'm uh... I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully, this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number two, the printing press. The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be, or not to be, 86 more folios? 
The alphabetical metal keys will be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink because they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories, all part of the mystery. What do you think, genius? Or did the guy have some help? One man in his time plays many parts. Number 10. Abe the Wrestler. At 20 years old with a record of 300 fights and one loss, he stands 6'4 inches at 185 pounds. You're a future president of the United States. Honest Abe! The chair! Give him the chair! That's right, Abe Lincoln was quite the ruffian. However, the wrestling back then wasn't as organized as there was no WWF per se. It was mostly just a show of strength and skill, but there were competitions among men. Huge crowds gathered, towns watched, everybody gambled. It was great, a little wrestling. His fights earned him respect while campaigning too. He would even scrap hecklers at debates. Yeah, just walks down midpoint and wheeler whips someone under their neck. His chirps were amazing too. He would just look at people like Gladiator and call them out. He'd be like, hey, I'm the big buck of this lick. If any of you want to try it, come on and get your wet horns. Yeah, I didn't think so. Sorry, Mr. Douglas, proceed. Thank you. Number nine, Roy Sullivan. They say lightning never strikes the same place twice, but if you knew Roy Sullivan, you knew that's not entirely true. Yeah, meet the man who was struck by lightning seven times and lived to tell the tale. Roy Sullivan was born in 1912. He sadly passed away in 1983 when he was 71 years old, but God tried, God tried a few times to get him out earlier, it seems. He was born in Greene County, Virginia. Roy was a park ranger in Shenandoah National Park in 1936. He was nicknamed the Human Lightning Conductor, and he appeared in the Guinness Book of World Records. Roy's first encounter with, you know, the might of Thor, was when he was just 30 years old at the Fire Lookout Tower. He said that lightning strike, again, out of the seven he survived, was the most painful out of all of them. The lightning bolt burned a strip all the way down his leg, even blowing a hole through his shoe. Yet somehow he survived. Roy was also hit by lightning in 1969 while driving a truck, and also in 1970 while gardening on an otherwise clear day like today, also in 1972 while inside a guardhouse, also in 1976 during another storm, and finally in 1977 while fishing. Yeah, Roy passed away in 1983, and to this day, two of his ranger hats are on display at the Guinness World exhibits in New York City and South Carolina. This man cheated death eight times. Seven. Number eight, Miss Unsinkable. Violet Constant Jessup, AKA the queen of sinking ships, or Miss Unsinkable, was an Argentine Irish woman who worked as an ocean liner stewardess, memoirist, and Red Cross nurse in the early 20th century. Jessup is well known for having survived three sinkings of major ships. The RMS Olympic in 1911, the RMS Titanic in 1912, and her sister the HMHS Britannic in 1916. Yeah, talk about the luckiest person ever. Lady's got some angels watching over her, I swear. The first ship, they turned around and made it back just in time. The Titanic, well, watch the movie, you'll understand. And then the third ship, it must have just felt personal by that point. Really? Not to mention barely surviving tuberculosis as a child. This woman is truly a saint. Returning to work after all those accidents, dedicating her entire life to the Red Cross, trying to save others, Sadly, she passed away at 83. Number seven, lost at sea. The Robertson family, they're quite a historical one. Strap in, folks. Back in 1971, Dougal, Lynn, and their four children, and Douglas, Neil, and Sandy, all set sail on what was planned to be a trip around the world. Sounds magnificent. Our family saw a movie once. 
Aboard their 13 meter boat, the Lucette, they traveled through the Caribbean and then across the Panama Canal to the Pacific, right? That was their trail. A year and a half went by, they were on route through the Galapagos and one of the daughters, Anne, who was 18, decided to leave the voyage. Yeah, she's like, ah, you know what? I'm actually not on board for this anymore. I'm really seasick, bye. And then in Panama, they took on a hitchhiker named Robin Williams great name. This hitchhiker was in for more of an adventure than they thought because after this point their lives were never the same again. West of the Galapagos Islands a pod of killer whales struck the boat. Wood then began to crack and the boat subsequently started to sink. They all moved to the inflatable life raft but after 16 days of using their own breath to keep inflating it over and over 24-7 the six of them were sadly forced to relocate into an even smaller dinghy. Then they somehow survived for 38 days at sea while sailing towards the center of the Pacific with no goal in mind other than to survive. All they had to drink was some water left over from the Lucette, with sea turtles being their only diet. Yeah, save the turtles, unless of course you're stranded at sea. Then in that case, sorry to 52 of you. Finally, after 38 days, they were spotted by a passing Japanese fishing boat, and then thankfully, they were rescued. Number six, Mad Jack Churchill. No, not that Churchill, but equally as British, and even bolder. Mad Jack Churchill, AKA, John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill was a British army officer who fought in the Second World War with a longbow, bagpipes, and a Scottish broadsword. Dude, this guy lived a life. Was in like every war. Trained people how to fight, how to parachute. This guy was fighting machine guns with a bow and a sword. And was at like the front of the lines, leading them. Taunting people, playing the bagpipes. You know how intimidating that is? How is there not like 15 movies about this guy? Not only did he thrive in the rough stuff, guy revolutionized surfing. He was also pissed the Americans dropped some nukes. He wanted to keep fighting, you know? Like imagine that pep talk. What eight lads? I'm gonna play a wee jingle here first and then I'm gonna go out, take this sword and I'm gonna start swinging. What eight? Good luck. Number five. Fake France. Towards the end of World War I, Paris was tired of, you know, seeing their city of love get blown to smithereens, as one would. So they figured, you know what? Let's try and fool those Germans, right? Let's try and do some trickery. Let's just build a fake Paris and then shut out all the lights. And it worked. Yeah, they psyched them out. They created a decoy, a very large decoy. The life-size stunt double was posted up only a few miles west of the actual city in order to protect it. This tiny town called Mason's Lafayette, now of course it's looking a lot more full than it was when it was, you know, a hollow shell of a fake town, now at the tourist area. There were once three different zones set up around the real Paris. Zone A was northeast of the city, had fake train stations, mimicked a suburban region of St. Denis, but it had a big fake Garde du Nord train station, right? That was the main pole. Like, hey, come on, we're looking nice and hopeful, come attack us, and it worked. Zone B, northwest of the city, that was Mason's Lafayette, the main fake Paris, right? And zone C was the industrial area, just east of the city. They had massive factories built with, you know, obviously nothing inside of them. This sounds pretty home alone when you think of it, but these missions only happening overnight, creating a light show with some big fancy props isn't a bad idea. It's gonna save a lot of lives and money. Lights were carefully spaced out so it looked like a breathing city from above, and they fell for it for some of the time. They looney tuned the Germans, and it worked. They're like, yeah, it's Paris. Hit that really fast. It's good. Number four, space junk. In 1961, John Glenn would become the first astronaut to successfully orbit in space. He lapped the Earth a couple times with the help of Friendship 7, NASA's command mission pushing ever closer and closer to the moon. While in space, Glenn and fellow crew noticed tiny gold particles that shone like fireflies. Quote, uh, this is Friendship 7. Uh, I'll try to describe what I'm seeing up here. Uh, it's a big mass of some very small particles that are brilliantly lit up like uh, they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're around a little. They're coming out of the capsule and they just look like stars. A whole shower of them coming over. Over. They had come to the conclusion it was liquid from inside the capsule and the suits leaking out. And that liquid was urine. Not aliens, not fireflies, not disintegrating ship. Frozen pee pee. Yeah, guess drinking all that tang all day. Glenn flew on Discovery in 1998 and became, at age 77, the oldest person to fly in space at the time. 
damn Shatner. Number three, Project MDXX. If you've seen Project X, this one's gonna ring a bell or two. About 500 years ago, yep, you missed it. In 1520, for two and a half weeks in June, both England's King Henry VIII and Francis Francis I, two of the greatest monarchs in Renaissance Europe, they both threw a joint birthday party that lasted 18 days, and it only cost about $19 million by today's standards. Nice. I went mini putting for my eighth birthday. That's why I call it Project MDXX. The numerals in the year, yeah, you get it, not bad. Not only was this a chance for them to celebrate their friendship, but it was also a chance for them to try and outdo one another and continue to show off. So for this huge bash, for starters, around 12,000 people showed up and gathered in the fields of the northern tip of what is now France. All tents, costumes, decorations were all gold embellished. Guests were fed 29,000 fish, 98,000 eggs, 6,400 birds, 2,200 sheep, and 216,000 gallons of wine just to wash all that clout down. Mm. On top of that, there were jousts, wrestling matches, elaborate mask parties. I have FOMO just talking about it right now. The two kings both wanted to outdo each other, but there were rules put in place beforehand. These kings could not compete with one another during the celebrations, right? So instead, they tried to outspend each other in a nice way. They're like, oh yes, look at all of my gold. No, look at all my gold. We love blowing all of our resources in two and a half weeks. Nice. Looking good, guys. Keep it up. Number two, Olympic arts. In the early 20th century, the Olympics were getting creative, literally. Hundreds of years of blood, sport, and victorious games, and people were looking for some new events. 1912, Summer Olympics, they decided to add official awarded medals for painting, sculpture, architecture, literature, and music. All right. One rule, though. They had to be of Olympic sport nature. Paintings of people boxing, sculptures of people whipping discs around, and of course, a couple doodles of some dudes playing rugby. Which won Gene Jacoby two gold medals. Of course, these were Olympic grade pieces of art. So you know they were the best of the best. Of course, you could compete in both sport and art. American athlete Walter Winnens took the podium after winning gold in sharpshooting, and also the very first gold in sculpture. Yeah, lovely. He made a little bronze horse pulling a chariot. Isn't that nice? People just taping up their wrists, mouth guards in, and you're just sharpening your pencil. Hey, how are you? About to draw. <laughs> Good luck. And finally, number one. Jurassic Timeline. All right, this one goes out to all the T-Rexes out there. If you're watching, hit that thumbs up with your little hands. Nice big reach, hit that subscribe button. When we think of the times of the dinosaurs, we tend to think of all of them roaming the planet at one time, and then a meteor hit, and then they were all toast. But that is certainly not the case. It's a little shocking, but here's our timeline. Dinosaur communities were not only spread apart by geography, but also by time and the age of the dinosaurs. For one, it lasted so long that it included three separate geological time periods. It's a long time. Fun fact, there is more time separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from the Stegosaurus than there is separating the Tyrannosaurus rex from humans. Yeah, that's how long ago dinosaurs have been kicking, or not kicking rather, you know what I mean? We can't comprehend this time. Like this is so far away, it doesn't even make sense. We think of the ancient Egyptians, we're like, oh, that's, I don't know. Dinosaurs? Stegosaurus, you know those herbivores with the plates on their back and the spiky tails, they always do this and take out your cars, whatever, Jurassic World, I've seen it. They roamed Earth 150 million years ago during the Jurassic period and the age of the dinosaurs. Then the T-Rex first appeared about 80 million years after the Stegosaurus had been extinct. And that was about, you know, 67 million years ago from today. This means that while 80 million years separated those two, there's only 67 million years that separate us from a T-Rex. Crazy fact. Uh, hit that thumbs up. Number 10, the first marathon. Now, the term marathon, right off the bat, it comes from ancient Greek history, the Battle of Marathon, I've certainly mentioned on this channel a few times. But let's look further a few hundred years, give or take. The first ever Olympics marathon. It was an absolute shit show. Seven miles from the finish line, one guy started ingesting strychnine and egg whites just so he could finish the race. So yeah, that was the first ever modern use of narcotics in an official Olympic game sport. One dude was also running the marathon in dress shoes and dress pants. Just a classy lad with 58 blisters just booking for hours at a time. William Garcia, one of the 32 competitors, straight up almost died during this marathon. He collapsed mid-race. He barely made a recovery. Have you done a marathon before? If so, tell me your experience down below. I did the Toronto Marathon a month ago and I got 35 kilometers out of 42. It was so close it hurt my soul. If only I wasn't wearing those dress shoes, you know, maybe I would have finished. So close. Number nine, Unsinkable Sam. In our last video, I asked who likes dogs and who likes cats and yada, yada, yada. This one here, 
I'll give to the cat people. You get one. Cats have nine lives. I'm a firm believer in this theory now. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. His tail began aboard a German warship called the Bismarck. Yeah, also imagine that image right there. 2,200 soldiers just standing in a line, and then also this black and white cat that somehow snuck aboard. Nobody knows how it got on, but I'm pretty sure one guy does. He's like, the Bismarck was decimated during one of the attacks, of course, and while the HMS Kozak was looking for survivors shortly after, they saw Oscar, the cat, on a plank. Yeah, he had to earn the unsinkable Sam alias, all right? You get a new life, you get a new name, then, then it happens. The HMS Kozak hauled him aboard, but then several months later, the Kozak was destroyed. Now this time, it was the HMS Ark Royal who spotted the cat, and then the fearless feline was dubbed Unsinkable Sam. Little man passed away in 1955, not on a warship, so that's great. I hope there's therapy in cat heaven, my god. He's like, well, four out of the nine sucked. I don't know. Number eight, Robert Liston. In the early 19th century, crowds would gather to watch Dr. Robert Liston work, okay? They would huddle around Around like it was a dance battle. They get nice and close and breathe in each other's mouths. He was known as the fastest knife surgeon in the West. I know, how many red flags can you find already? A crowd, a fast surgery, this guy just in the middle of it. What's going on? Like, please help me. Please put me together. I don't know. This was a time before anesthesia had been developed, so you wanted things wrapped up quick. Pun intended. Now, Robert, he would have you amputated and sutured in three minutes flat, right? Don't you want that? Don't you want a nice fast surgery? Mortality rate it was 300%. Not great at all, in fact. And then one fateful day, Robert attempted to beat any record previously held. He was trying to perform the fastest surgery, but during so, he accidentally cut off his assistant's fingers as well as the patient's leg. So, I don't know what the guy's doing with his arms, but you're like, buddy, slow down. We got more than three minutes, it seems. He also hit somebody else watching by accident. You know what I mean? Remember how I said crowds would gather, the old surgery crowd? This is why you don't stand too close, okay? It's like crump battles. You get too close, you're getting nicked by something. Either Robert or some guy in Tim's. Both are gonna hurt. I'm glad surgeons are taking their time now. I'm also glad no surgeons are trying new experiments at a record time. That's also nice. Can you take your time, please? Number seven, the first open heart surgery. Moving on to some other surgeons a little better, hopefully. We've discussed ancient Egyptians and how they would clean the entire body out for the whole mummification process and then put the heart back in. Now, of course, they weren't alive during any of this, but when was the first open heart surgery? When did that happen? What did that room look like? The first successful open heart surgery went down in Chicago in 1893. It was honestly unbelievable. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. It was probably Robert Liston just doing his thing. Maybe he got too close, I don't know. And the surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hill, Williams, who, by the way, used to be a shoemaker's assistant, he saved this man's life and he also made history. In the city's first interracial hospital too, might I add. So a lot of firsts happening in this one. Now there weren't any textbooks on this type of operation at the time, so the odds of survival, of course, were extremely low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all. Right? No x-rays, no antibiotics, no anesthesia, no problem, right? Using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through all the nerves slowly, might I add, thankfully. He weaved through muscles, ribs, everything until eventually he closed a severed artery right near the heart. Cornish survived, thankfully, and come 1894, Williams was promoted to chief surgeon at the Freedmen's Hospital in Washington, DC. Imagine he went back to being a shoemaker's assistant. He's like, all right, cool. Now I want those shoes. Number six, the Pfizer fine. When we think of the name Pfizer now, there's obviously mixed feelings, pun intended. But back in 2009, before they were making cures, they were paying some hefty fines. The world's largest pharmaceutical company had to pay a record-breaking fine. They had to pay $2.3 billion in criminal and civil penalties over unlawful prescription drug promotions. Now included in this mighty slap on the wrist was a $1.2 billion criminal fee. Now if that didn't sound bad enough, in the agreement was also a criminal forfeiture of $105 million. So you're paying and you're also getting more stuff taken away, it's all bad. This was the fourth time Pfizer got charged with this magnitude in a decade. They were on a pretty bad streak. What got them in hot water in the first place is that they would promote their products at resorts, right? They would invite doctors to these meetings, give them golf, massages, whatever. They would pepper you up nice so that you were team Pfizer by the end of the trip. And you were all tanned, you looked nice, right? FBI Assistant Director Kevin Perkins says the corporate giant was blatantly violating the law and misleading the public through
your false marketing claims. Number five, no birds at the funeral. If you ever want to liven up a funeral, try bringing a parrot. They love to heckle, turns out. Former President Andrew Jackson, he passed away a long time ago. He passed away in 1845. Now, it's important to note that he passed away before his pet did. He passed away before his pet parrot died. So the parrot, of course, attended the funeral, right? How lovely, right? I bet after I said that, you said, oh, maybe you gave it a thumbs up, maybe you subscribed. Good stuff going around, right? It's lovely. Thing is, the parrot loved to swear. Yeah, you had a few curse words in his back pocket. This parrot actually heckled so much during the funeral that they had to remove it. How epic is that? It got kicked out like it was a comedy club. They're like, all right, put your wings behind your little bird neck. We're out of here. Number four, illegal pedestrian crossing. I see this far too often living in the city. Toronto is wild for this. It drives me crazy. People jaywalking. Looks like there's not a truck coming your way. They do that little wave, a little smile, a little weird walk, and they just go wherever they want. Middle of a Toronto intersection. They're like, hey, I'm 92. See ya. Everyone's slamming their brakes, avoiding them all of a sudden. You're holding up traffic even more. Now in China, jaywalking, that's a no-go. Article 40 of Beijing's traffic law stipulates that drivers and motor vehicles cannot suddenly stop even if it's at a crosswalk. So yeah, you can't even stop when you're at a crosswalk. You have to wait for cars. So if you're not in a car, you have to wait. You don't get the right of way automatically, like, you know, most of the time. And for drivers, it's forbidden to stop at these crossings. You gotta just keep going. If you do, you're getting a fine. Hopefully just a warning, but possibly a fine for stopping at a crosswalk. How insane is that? Number three, raining coffee. The sky is falling. Sometimes it's frozen lizards and sometimes it's bugs. But you know what? Sometimes maybe coffee will fall from the sky. I don't know. Get your mugs ready. We're waking up early tomorrow. I don't know. Back in 1969, a South Carolina factory was busy. The non-dairy creamer, Cremora, was doing great production-wise, but they didn't have the greatest air vents in the factory. All of a sudden, the powder mixture leaked out one day, went into the air, where it then mixed with falling rain, and... Voila, now we have double doubles falling from the clouds. Now we have a really odd rainfall. Chester, South Carolina. It was the day we woke up to coffee goop on our lawns instead of dew. That's memorable for sure. The company ended up paying a fine of $4,000 for allowing their product to be released from the plant. Could have been worse, could have been a lot worse. Could have been a spider factory, I don't know. First thing I can think of. Number two, it can't stop all of us. Remember that Area 51 raid that went down back in 2019? Months of planning, gathering heads, planning trips, renting cars, all to get everyone out to Nevada. Everyone was determined to find out the truth about aliens. It was a big raid where everyone planned to overthrow every Area 51 guard. So, did it work? What ended up happening there? I forget. Everyone, we're not here for photos. We're here to rescue the aliens. Rescue. Yeah, okay, it didn't work. Turns out a handful of gamers can't overthrow a government military base. Who knew? Shoot, maybe next time, I don't know. So what was the goal here? 1.5 million people signed up to storm Area 51 in 2019, but this wasn't the first time something like this happened. Back in the 1950s, the public also wanted answers. It was June 17th, 1959, and the Rizzo Evening Gazette published a story with the headline reading, More Flying Objects Seen in Clark Sky. That's pretty alarming. Then the paper went on to describe how Sergeant Wayne Anderson, a local sheriff, was one of many who spotted what the paper described as an object bright green in color and descending towards the earth at a speed too great to be an airplane. Yeah, I just watched Jordan Peele's No. Couldn't have done this list at a better time if you ask me. What did they see? It was green, it was close, was it Optimus Prime just coming to say what's up? I need answers, folks. And finally, number one, tombstones ashore. Here we go, death is calling. Back in 2012, the world thankfully did not end, but if you believed that it was going to, this definitely would have freaked you out. Back in May 2012, two friends were on a nice beach walk right on the coast of San Francisco's Ocean Beach. Now, when all of a sudden something that looked like a fridge started to crash through the waves and then onto the shore. Now, it turns out it was not a fridge. That would have been lovely. It would have been a nice surprise. Just some fridge goods popping out from 1976. It turns out it was a massive tombstone from the year 1876. It was a little more haunting than a fridge. The tomb originally belonged to Emma Bosworth and then just one month later, another stone was found, this time with a different name. Of course, that'd be weird if it was the same name again. And then another one, and then another one. So what's going on here? The next tombstone belonged to Delia Presby Oliver from 1890. But the condition that they were in also, these tombstones, they looked brand new. You probably expect as I'm describing this that they're all old and broken apart. Nope. They're all pristine, even more haunting almost. I don't know. These tombstones came from the Laurel Hill Cemetery after it had shut its gates in 1940. So the headstones were then used as a makeshift seawall. If you ask me, that's a little rude. Your uncle's tombstone just covered in barnacles like he's Davy Jones? No thanks, pop that out, put that back, draw that out. Kicking off the list at number 10, accidental science. 
aka the discovery of penicillin. Sometimes miracles happen when nobody's looking. Alexander Fleming first discovered penicillin back in 1928. At the time, he was actually studying Staphylococcus, which is a bacteria that causes infections and boils, all that nasty stuff. But right before Alexander left for a two week vacation, he left a petri dish with some of that Staphylococcus on the lab table rather than storing it away in an incubator. During this well needed time off, a penicillium mold spore just drifted in there, either through a window or the lab door, some Horton Here's a Who adventure. This tiny speck was well on its way. Way, it was the perfect conditions for a spore flight. The temperature of the room wasn't too breezy, and the lack of one Alexander Fleming allowed time for the mold to fight back and prevent that bacteria from growing any further. He discovered this antibacterial substance was only produced by strains of penicillium. Yeah, the guy accidentally creates penicillin on his time off. What a great time. The 20s were an odd but brilliant time. Number nine, prohibition. It's a law that puts fear into wine drinking moms and beer drinking dads across the nation. For there was a time when the sale and consumption of alcohol was banned. That means it was a dry country, not one drop to be had. Except for those uh, found in loopholes and all the other crazy loopholes in the system. And by that, I actually mean organized crime filling the shoes of breweries and other openings like uh, literal underground bars called speakeasies to keep the sauce flowing. You know what I mean. Now, to be fair, there was an issue with drinking back in the day, but there's a few issues with banning it as well. The first being that it was in high demand, like stupid high even before it was banned. So banning it basically gave a green light to bootleggers and criminals to make millions, and they did. And second, it was America's fifth largest industry, putting many out of work and dissolving a very large portion of tax revenue. No surprise it didn't work out. Number eight, the work week. Okay, seriously, who do we have to talk to? Who do we have to blame for having to work nine to five, Monday to Friday? Dolly Parton has a groovy tune about it, but when did the 40 hour work week start? Well, 1926 is your answer. The Ford Motor Company of all companies. Yeah, who do you think? They were the first to have factory workers clock in and out 40 hours a week with a weekend. Nice. Whereas before, you maybe had one day off, maybe, depending on what you were doing. Obviously more time to rest, eat, and clear your mind, maybe work out. This increased productivity, so it spread like wildfire. Cut to today, we're now advocating for a four day work week. We're getting greedy, I know. Shorter hours, same workload, apparently this is going well. Productivity is soaring. In Iceland, for example, 2,500 workers tested this four day work week. That's literally 1% of Iceland's population, so it worked. Pretty big test run. But now 86% of Iceland's workforce have shorter hours. It's great, seems like we're well on our way. So sorry, Mr. Ford, we're taking back our Fridays. Okay, number seven, Valentine's Day. Not the most romantic Valentine's Day ever, but maybe one of the most infamous. Back in 1929, organized crime was no joke. It was everywhere. Thanks to prohibition and a lot of corruption, it was the age of gangsters. However, one incident in 1929 changed things. On February 14th, 1929, seven gang members were deleted. This proved to be too much for the public at the time, and the final straw in a large string of violent crimes was up. Until this point, a lot of crooks and gangsters like Al Capone were idolized for the lavish lifestyles and ritzy and swanky nights in the town. This, however, was one step too far and helped to further reform and crime, giving a certain FBI predecessor to rise up and eventually found the FBI. The lesson here? Sure, being a gangster is great. Sign your autographs, live like a fat cat in your penthouse, but there's only so much you can get away with. After it was all said and done, Capone got put away too. And if they can get Capone, they can get you. Number six, the birth of brands. When it comes to advertisements, you can't even take the bus down the street without seeing hundreds of ads. I'll catch myself staring at a Sunwing ad for 43 minutes just so I can avoid eye contact with Johnny Jingle Keys in front of me. Even growing up, the amount of pop-ups I had to close really fast, my reflexes are so sharp now, all thanks to those gross pop-ups. And it all started 100 years ago. Huge brands began popping up in the 1920s with these fun slogans, big colorful ads. The 20s witnessed the birth of advertisements from Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, Hostess Cakes, Welch's, and of course, one of the most unforgettable, Kool-Aid. Yeah, the Kool-Aid man is 95 years old. Yeah, I bet his knees are starting to feel like glass, that's for sure. Other companies that popped at this time was CVS, the automobile industry, obviously, and two brothers in California named Walt and Roy Disney. Yeah, they had some startup cartoon studio. Not sure what happened there. Best of luck, guys, keep going. Hopefully they have a GoFundMe, maybe. Number five, the League of Nations. 
World War I, she was a little bit of a doozy. Unlike some wars, World War I actually changed a lot after it was said and done. Borders changed, lines on maps, empires fell, some rose. Political ideas changed and the history of Europe's future was sealed the second the ink dried on the Treaty of Versailles. After the nations who were involved with the war took stock of what happened and it was clear we could never let this happen again. So the League of Nations was created, Beta UN if you will. The idea was simple, peace, disarmament and to step in when such horrific things were to ever happen again. I'm sure they won't. Well, the planning didn't go very well, and when it was finished, the US ultimately didn't decide to join when they were one of the founding members. Ugh. Mind you, the US had a different mindset on foreign wars back then, but they were still involved. The League dissolved shortly after the Second World War ended. Number four, flappers. What a fun word they've been. In August 1920, history was forever changed when the 19th Amendment was passed, finally giving women the right to vote. Now look, in a list of ridiculous events, I'm adding this because it took a ridiculously long time to happen. Yeah, a little twist there for you. At first you're like, what? Relax, we're working. This was post-World War I, when women were still working all these jobs, high paying jobs, might I add. So now there's no way they're gonna let those go. There's momentum in the workforce. So come August 1920, American women got the right to vote officially. Then Margaret Sanger came along the same year, which led us to women's right to birth control. A lot of momentum. Like Big Ched mentioned earlier, prohibition ended legal alcohol sales, but with jazz and women's independence post-war on the rise, you couldn't stop all this momentum. Thus, the flapper girl was introduced to American slang. Yeah, smoking in public, drinking and dancing at jazz clubs, all things that were upsetting their Victorian lineage before them. Oh, you wanna dance to jazz and have fun post-war? How dare thou? You wanna show your calf after working doubles during a war? How dare you? Put those caps away, put that out. Number three, the Russian Revolution. Revolution, comrades. The 1920s were a crazy time, man. And if you look at the history between the US and Russia, it's almost like a hero and a villain origin story. Okay, hear me out. World War I was a bad time for Russia. They dropped out in early 1918, shortly before the whole thing ended. Why? Because the communists were there to take over. That's just how it went. Russia went from a 300 year Romanov rule to communism within a few short years. Safe to say this was having a great effect on the already struggling nation. It seemed that the harder things got, the more communist Russia got. When looking at the states after World War I, for the most part, it was a huge financial gain. And besides being the decade of gangsters and bootleggers, this was the start of many corporations and brands, like Taylor mentioned. It seemed as things got better and became more capitalist. Interesting indeed, duality. Hmm. Number two, the Ponzi scheme. We've all heard the term Ponzi scheme at one point or another, but what does that even mean? Who is this man? Where can I find him? Ah, why are we so mad at him? Why is he scheming so often? Why, who does that? A Ponzi scheme is of course a sham of an operation. It all kicks off back in the 1920s when one Italian immigrant named Charles Ponzi moved to the United States. He arrived to the States with the same goal as anyone, to work. That's it, just to work and you know, be successful. At first he didn't have much luck, but eventually Charles was hired at Bank Zerosi. And when the bank sadly went bankrupt, Ponzi was SOL. He needed to do something and he needed to do something fast. So he dabbled into smuggling, but he got caught. After he was released, he went into the postal system, started to buy large quantities of postal coupons from countries with you know, a weak economy, and then he hired a bunch of agents, trained them up good, you know, Wolf of Wall Street style, and the whole idea was that you would promise investors that they would receive double their investment back in return within 45 days. How lovely is that? Thus, the Ponzi scheme is born. Yeah, these agents got 10% commission too, which as far as scams go, it's not too shabby. Not bad at all. Number one, Black Tuesday. Uh-oh, stinky, the market crashed and now everyone's going broke. Big oof, right? Adam told me to say that, anyway. Yes, the great market crash of 29. It wasn't good. A mixture of outstanding loans, an already declining unemployment percentage, a struggling agriculture sector mixed in with a speck of low wages and stocks just not being worth what they were is the cause of the crash. By 1932, a lot of stocks were only worth 20% of what they originally were before. The stock market crash was not the main cause of the Great Depression, however, it was a symptom of it. The market wouldn't fully be back to normal until after FDR's New Deal, or realistically, when World War II had started and kicked America's, and really, the world's economy back into turbo mode. Number 10, 
Cursed Trumpets King Tut's trumpets are a pair that were found in the burial chamber of the 18th Dynasty Pharaoh upon discovery. One silver and one bronze, the oldest operational trumpets in the world and the only known surviving examples from ancient Egypt. Both are engraved with images of the gods and both were silent for more than 3,000 years before the trumpets were played for 150 million people live on a BBC broadcast in 1939. And then World War II happened. Yeah, because apparently the curator of the Tut collection at the Egypt Museum says whenever they're played, a war occurs. Yeah. The bronze trumpet was stolen from the museum in Cairo during the looting riots of 2011 and then hilariously enough returned two weeks later. Yeah, apparently Buddy didn't like the ancient gods just roaming his condo. Uh, you think? Number 9. Annabelle. The most infamous and dangerous possessed doll in the world. Yeah, pretty well all you need to know about that. Found at the home of the Warren's Occult Museum in Connecticut, we know a little bit about this doll with all the films about her. She rests inside a glass case marked warning, positively do not touch. Aggressive, but necessary. Gifted to a nursing student from a thrift store in the 70s, incidents involving levitating onto the table and running around at night, she took the doll to a medium who said it was possessed by a little girl who had passed. Ed and Lorraine were called shortly after and they offered to take it to their home. On the way home, Ed said that the doll was making the car do funny things. Swerving, no power steering, brake checks, Haunted, haunted. Yeah. The museum unfortunately shut down in 2019, but the cursed objects seem to be staying put, which the owners even refuse to make eye contact with. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I would definitely Ronaldo that thing across the room if it was running around my apartment 2 a.m. Just field goal it right out the window. Number eight, Travis Walton. The horrifying abduction of Arizona forester Travis Walton. This is my favorite alien abduction case, yet the scariest, hands down. Fire in the Sky, filmed in 1993, does a pretty bang up job at what happened that night. In 1975, Walton and a logging crew were working in the National Forest. Him and six of his co-workers encountered a saucer-shaped craft feet away from their truck making a high-pitched tone. The curious Walton was then blasted by a light beam and apparently abducted into their ship. The men were terrified and drove off immediately. Walton claims that he then woke up in a hospital room on board, observed by three short bald creatures, before fighting tirelessly and losing consciousness. He remembers nothing else until he found himself awake walking along a highway five days later, naked, just wandering the highway in a daze. He's had tons of interviews, Guy was definitely taken. He's also so peaceful about it too. He's just convinced that they tried to heal him from the accidental blast. I check your organs and your pineal gland. Just make sure they're all there and intact, you know? Holy moly. Number seven, werewolves of London. Real werewolves. In the 80s, Lorraine and Ed Warren traveled in search of a real life wolf man. Apparently they were watching a TV show following the life of a local werewolf, Bill Ramsey in London, England, and Lorraine felt a strange connection to him. After a quick trip to London for more answers, she found Bill's whereabouts. Unlike usual werewolf folklore, he didn't transform every full moon and he didn't get bit. Bill Ramsey was apparently possessed by an evil wolf spirit. That's right. It was so bad that he needed a full-blown exorcism. The Warrens brought Bill back to Connecticut to meet Bishop Robert McKenna, and the exorcism was a success. Thanks to everyone involved that day, Bill lives a pretty normal life now, very unpossessed. Yeah, I'd hope so. This is terrifying. Imagine that's your neighbor. Yeah, sometimes I change into a werewolf once in a blue moon. I'm Bill, nice to meet you, welcome to the neighborhood. This is a fruitcake. Number six. Osiris. Yet again, something stolen that's very, very old. Why do people steal the oldest, most cursed stuff? The infamous statue of Osiris. In 1971, during an excavation in Saqqara, Egyptologist Walter Brian Emery found a small statue of the Egyptian god of death, Osiris. Emery took the statue of Osiris and once at his house, Emery went to the bathroom to shower. After a few moments, apparently his assistant heard Emery screaming in fear. He found him, clutching the sink, scared to death and paralyzed. Emery was diagnosed with paralysis of the right side of his body and was unable to speak. He died the following day. Uh, yeah, talk about a curse of the pharaohs. Like, buddy, you can't just steal stuff and then just throw it up overseas in a museum. Especially the stuff that clearly says in hieroglyphics, do not remove, this is cursed. It's pretty clear right there. Like, never steal anything ancient, you know? That's just a scary movie like waiting to happen. Number five. The Perrin family. In 1952, Ed and Lorraine founded the New England Society for Psychic Research. They quickly gained notoriety after this next case. 
the Perrins. In 1971, the Perrin family, Carolyn, Roger, and their five daughters moved into a 14-room farmhouse in Rhode Island. At first, items started disappearing, then the ghostly sightings started. It was discovered that the home had some previous sinister owners, self-emulation, freak accidents, and of course, murder in the attic. Whoever the spirit was, she perceived herself to be the mistress of the house, and she resented the competition my mother posed. The parents asked the Warrens to come in more than 10 separate times to help against this sinister, ghastly entity. During one seance, Carolyn was possessed, even rising from the ground while sitting in a chair. Andrea, the oldest daughter, said, My mother began to speak a language not of this world in a voice not of her own. Then her chair levitated and she was thrown across the room. Yeah, just zipping around the house, floating around on a chair like the Jetsons? Yeah, no thank you, that's like haunted, haunted. Just bulldoze that thing, would ya? Number four, the ring. One ring to rule them all. The vine ring, AKA the ring of Silvianus, is a gold ring from the fourth century AD. The ring was discovered on a farm in 1785 in England. First, the property of a British Roman named Silvianus. Apparently, it was stolen by a person named Senecianus, upon which Silvianus hexed the ring with a curse. In 1929, during excavations of the site, archaeologists discovered the now curse that goes with said ring, consulting shortly after with one J.R.R. Tolkien. Mm. The band of the ring has 10 edges. Among it is the goddess Venus engraved, along with the words, live in God. The lore goes, Silvianus' ring was stolen by someone named Senecianus. Silvianus created and hexed a tablet, which he wrote, for the god Nodens. Silvianus has lost a ring that has donated one half of its worth to Nodens. Among those named Senecianus, permit no good health until it's returned to the temple of Nodens. Yeah, that sounds like a spell to me, dude. And Noden is like Poseidon, so you don't want any of that smoke. Number three. A haunting in Connecticut. Based on all real case end point, a 2009 gem, the accounts of the horrific case of the Snedekers who moved into a ghost infested house in Connecticut, unknowingly moving in to one of the most sinister haunted funeral homes on earth. At first, mom notices items missing, but that's just the start. Then the children started to see strange people in their home, and then their son started to act a little strange. Violent outbursts, physical attacks on his own family, Maybe he was becoming the next victim to the house's grim history. After months of scary stuff going on, the Warrens were finally called in and turned out the morticians that had lived there previously had practiced some abysmally sinister acts on some lifeless bodies, deepening the home into the hell it was now sold as. An exorcism or two later, and the house finally became a home again. The case can be reimagined in 2009's Haunting in Connecticut, where the story follows the story drawn out by the Snedekers all those sinister years ago. Yo, Taylor gets possessed, I'm swinging immediately. You know what I mean? Like so many holy hands right away, just. Number two, Statue of Lem. The Women of Lem statue was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878 and dates back to about 3500 BCE. The statue earned the nickname the Goddess of Death after four different families experienced tragedy while possessing the carved stones. The first owner, along with his entire family, died within six years of owning the statue, all of mysterious and rapid illnesses. The other two owners also died, of course, along with their entire families, just a few short years after obtaining the statue. The fourth owner died alongside his wife and two daughters of mysterious causes while in possession of the rock. Now, a gift to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh, it's encased in glass, safe, and unable to bear any other family bad omens. And number one, the mummy. My number one spot, of course, this is the most terrifying find of all. In 1991, a 5,000 year old frozen preserved human mummy was discovered in the frozen Otzel Apse of Italy. Otzi, of course, is the name the researchers chose to name this mummy for obvious location reasons. Otzi, though, is believed to have been murdered before being frozen in time due to the discovery of an arrowhead embedded in his left shoulder, various wounds on his body, and also the blood soaked tunic he's wearing with multiple people's DNA on it. Maybe in combat, maybe from megafauna. Who knows? Scientists believe that he's the oldest known naturally preserved mummy on Earth. This is where it's gonna get spooky. Once unearthed, a curse surfaced too, and grew stronger as people linked to him began to die one after another in violent freak accidents. So far, seven deaths have been tied or related to Otzi's dethawing, including forensic pathologist who was killed in a car accident en route to give a speech about Otzi. 
a mountaineer in an avalanche, a hiker who discovered the Iceman falling down a treacherous path, the molecular archaeologist was found dead in his home, the head of the forensic team had a heart attack, another discoverer died of a sudden brain tumor, and another of multiple sclerosis. Yo, say what you will about curses, when people start dropping all involved with the find, I'd say it's probably the 5,000 year old mummy you just found. You think? Number 10, Monica. There have only been three presidents to be formally impeached in the US. Andrew Johnson was the first. Most recent would be Donald Trump, twice, but the second would be none other than President Bill Clinton. In November of 1995, Mr. Clinton began to have a spicy little entanglement with 21-year-old unpaid intern Monica Lewinsky at the White House. But just like every decision to hit up a Taco Bell, that kind of thing always comes back to bite you. You think maybe this time will be okay, and then you're sweating on the toilet on the verge of tears. Monica began to tell her co-worker Linda Tripp about the little affair she was a part of, and unbeknownst to Miss Lewinsky, Linda began to record it all. After another woman, Paula Jones, began to sue the president for sexual harassment, Lewinsky was subpoenaed, and things just went on a spiral of investigation that climaxed on December 19, 1998, when Bill Clinton was charged with lying under oath to a federal grand jury and obstructing justice. But he finished his term, so. Number nine, Hindenburg. Flight. For many years, people have dreamed of flying with the birds in the sky. In the early 1900s, this became a reality. Air travel and machine design quickly developed over a short period of time. While today we are most familiar with airplanes, jets, and helicopters, there was another vehicle that was becoming a mainstay of military use and air travel. Blimps, or airships. After a brief use in World War I, they became something of a luxury. Long distance, smooth air travel. The issue? Well, they were kind of slow and prone to crashing, which is bad. What's the cause of these crashes? Well, to be exact, there's more than one, but the big issue or the big problem for these airships was that they were filled with hydrogen. Your 10th grade chemistry teacher will let you know just how flammable and dangerous that gas is. The Hindenburg airship crashed on a routine landing in 1937. Oh, the humanity. Number eight, Oppenheimer. I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. The Hindu scripture that ran through the mind of J. Robert Oppenheimer when he first witnessed the devastation of the device he led the creation of on July 16, 1945. He was not wrong. Ever since Nagasaki and Hiroshima, the entire world knows the absolute world-ending potential nuclear war could unleash. Oppenheimer was the leader of the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, New Mexico, beginning in 1942, which was basically meant to figure out how to use atomic energy for the military. They were successful enough that it directly led to Oppenheimer wanting to completely stop development. And when they wouldn't, he straight up resigned. Instead, he became chairman of the General Advisory Committee of the Atomic Energy Commission. And in October 1949, he opposed the development of the devices he helped create. This simple opposition led to him being labeled a communist supporter, suspended from secret nuclear research, and stripped of his security clearance by the Atomic Energy Commission. He wanted to help prevent the development of weapons that could bring on the apocalypse. Sometimes history makes me legitimately upset. Number seven, Mr. Yamaguchi. There are those that possess the power of ninjutsu. There are those that harness the power of titans. And there are those who transform from a Japanese schoolgirl into a schoolgirl with a sailor outfit and have the power of the moon. I, I don't know. Well, then there are those who possess the power to resist the apocalypse. Mr. Yamaguchi is a unique man. A man who survived not one, but two atomic detonations during World War II. The great part? He lived a long life, advocating for peace in a nuclear arms free world. The first initial blast left him with burns and hearing loss. When telling people of a survival story three days later, no one would believe him, as such a thing could not exist, right? Well, that's when the second detonation occurred. This time he was unharmed, and I'm sure people believed him that time. Number six, Obama. While it should not be unusual, it was, and it was groundbreaking. On November 4th, 2008, Barack Hussein Obama Jr. became the first African American president in the history of the United States of America and gave hope to millions of Americans that they too could achieve anything they wanted to. His father grew up in the Inyaza province of Kenya before going to Hawaii to study economics, where he met the future president's mother, Ann Dunham, from Kansas. 
As a former senator of Illinois, whose campaign slogan was change we can believe in and yes we can, Barack was elected to a second term over Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney in 2012. As president, Barack was the winner of the 2009 Nobel Peace Prize. He was responsible for the passage of the Affordable Health Care Act, the de-lifing of Osama bin Laden by SEAL Team 6, and the legalization of gay marriage by the Supreme Court. Nice. Number five, Violet Jessup. Miss Unsinkable. What if I told you that Miss Jessup was a survivor of the Titanic, Britannic, and the Olympic? I know, right? The Titanic should need no introduction. It always has been and will be immortalized by a James Cameron movie. But you may not know that the Titanic had sister ships, the Britannic and the Olympic. Miss Violet Jessup was a nurse on all three. The Titanic hit an iceberg and sank, of course. The Britannic hit a sea mine and sank. The Olympic had a fender bender with another ship, but uh, that one didn't sink. Just kind of a, just a little bit of damage to the hull, but it made it back to shore, so that's that's good. Now, I'm not superstitious or anything like that, but the odds and luck of finding yourself on three of the largest vessels and surviving all of those three catastrophes? I don't know. Bad omen or good luck charm? Maybe just stay off that line of cruisers. Regardless, she is remembered as Miss Unsinkable and for her bravery in all scenarios, especially the Britannica. A severe head injury didn't even stop her. You go, girl. You go. Number four, Amelia Earhart. Almost everyone has heard of her at some point in their lives. Amelia Earhart's disappearance somewhere over the Pacific in July of 1937 is one of the world's greatest unsolved mysteries. Amelia Earhart was a female American aviator who set a literal ton of records and pushed for women advancing in aviation. She was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic and the first to fly solo from Hawaii to the mainland. She served as a Red Cross nurse's aide in our home of Toronto during World War II and would spend her time watching pilots in the Royal Flying Corps train while hanging out there. She was the first woman to receive the Flying Cross's Military Medal awarded for heroism or extraordinary achievement while participating in an aerial flight. But it was in 1937 when she would try and fly around our lovely blue and green globe and would disappear into legend. Number three, refuse espionage. All right, folks, this is a new one for me. So during the Cold War, the eastern half of the world was cozying up to this brand new thing called communism. What? What's that? And what's better than that? The two major superpowers in the east were now both communist and cozying up to each other like Lenin in a Marx book by an open fire. Naturally, this made the west and America sweat. Make me sweat too. A lot of things do. It was concerning to say the least. Russia and China, socialist best friends. Everything was just peachy, except that Stalin did not exactly trust Mao. So to learn more about his new best friend, he had spies manipulate some things and uh, was going to judge what kind of a leader he was off of a stolen stool sample. Yes, you heard that right. For example, a lack of potassium in your refuse could be related to something of a nervous disposition, not the kind of qualities you want in your dictator best friend. Kind of like reading astrology, but from the sewer. Number two, movies. Going to the movies, the smell of popcorn, awkward first dates, and memories of sticky floors with no explanation. I love going to the movies, but it wouldn't be possible without the invention of the cinematograph and the Lumiere brothers, Louis and August. Louis Lumiere's Cinemagraph, which patented in 1895, was a combination movie camera and projector that would display moving images on a screen for an audience. The Cinematograph was smaller, lighter, and used less film than the Kinetograph and Kinetoscope, invented by Thomas Edison. And in 1896, the brothers opened up the first theaters called cinemas to show what they made. They sent camera crews around the world to shoot new material. Did not take long for this tech to travel, though. America opened its first cinemas in New Orleans the same year. In 1909, we got our first film review from the New York Times, the first Hollywood film studio in 1911, and Charlie Chapman started his career in 1914. And now we have mega corporations that pump out blockbusters monthly. Nice. Number one, Elvira, Elvira. So smart, this one, honestly, so five head. So back in World War II, Germany went on tour. The tour included soldiers, ships, planes, and tanks. Mechanization, baby, nice. It's what we do. Now, any dad out there that's been doing small engine repair in the garage will tell you that sometimes a motor comes along that just stumps you. No matter how long you work on her, she just doesn't want to start. Only if you had a handbook to describe her inner workings. But you lost the manual years ago in the spring cleaning of 98. Ooh, sorry. Well, German soldiers had that manual, and to make them pay attention to said manual, there was illustrations of a gorgeous woman named Elvira who, on a lot of pages, would be missing parts of her clothing and or in revealing positions. 
So the equation goes, tough engine repair plus book of knowledge multiplied by a pretty cartoon lady equals paying attention. What about the engine again? Number 10, Albert. Adam, how is Queen Victoria's marriage to Prince Albert bizarre? Well, my little honeybees, not to be a pessimist, but it's bizarre because they actually really did love each other. Uh? Be honest, how often do you think it occurred that people of royal or noble birth actually got to marry someone they genuinely loved? On February 10th, 1840, Queen Victoria married Prince Albert of Saxe-Coburg-Gotha, who, interestingly, was her first cousin and who was actually kind of not the favorite of the British people who saw him as an outsider. As queen, she was the one to propose. Good for you, queen. Literally. The couple stayed married for 21 years until Albert died of typhoid in 1861. And together, the couple had nine children. Nine. Even after his death, Queen Victoria continued to make ruling decisions based on the principle of what would Albert do? It's such a nice way to start this heinous list. Number nine, Napoleonic Wars. Okay, a little bit of a stretch, but I would argue the Victorian era lasted from about 1814 to 1914. There's no specific date, but it could be classified around this time. The Napoleonic Wars were essentially world wars started by one man, the Corsican Ogre. Hello. Imagine having the whole world against you. No, really, the whole world against you. Britain, Prussia, Russia, Austria, and sometimes Italy took part in the coalition wars, which were just part of Napoleon's story. Trust me, this dude was arrogant and he was the antagonist of the story. He's been labeled as the greatest tactician ever. When it was all said and done, he had rediscovered ancient Egypt, fought many battles, and managed to become emperor. And he got banished twice. Eight, mummy unwrapping parties. What is your favorite idea of a get together? Let me know down below, I won't judge, I promise. Unless, of course, you say mummy unwrapping parties like some people in the Victorian era might have. Then I will indeed judge you. Thanks to the Napoleonic Wars making their way to Egypt, interest in the country was on the up and up. And while people have been buying mummies since the Elizabethan era, now these rich weirdos bought even more, bringing them back as souvenirs. Once they got to the homestead, they would almost instantly hold parties with all their rich friends where they would unwrap their mummies like a Christmas present. Congratulations! It's exactly what you thought it would be! A five or six thousand year old decaying corpse that smells horrible. Why are rich people like this? I, I don't get it. Number seven, Fire Hazard Christmas. Like all families at Christmas, we all have our traditions. I'm a good boy all year, so Santa can bring me lots of gifts. Thanks, Santa. My family tradition is to watch the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation every year. I love that movie. Adam, on the other hand, well, he's a bad boy, and he eats all the chocolate out of his advent calendar before it's time. Don't tell him I said anything, though. I can't help it. <laughs> He's right there. However, one family Christmas tradition was quite popular back in Victorian times, oftentimes called Snapdragon. Uh, the basis of this game was to get a large bowl, fill it with dad's brandy, and drop some large raisins in said bowl. Next, get a candle or a match and uh, light it up. Now that there's a large cauldron of flaming liquid and fireballs in your living room, now your objective is to try and knock the raisins out of the dish without getting burned. Fun for the whole family, why not? Just be mindful, you know, that the whole house is made of wood and there's no fire alarms and there's no modern firefighting equipment and everyone's wearing long gowns and you get the point. Number six, maybe we were apes? November 24th, 1859 marks the day that none other than Charles Darwin published the famous and even infamous On the Origin of Species, presenting his theory of natural selection and questioning the theory of creation. Truly a great day in my opinion. Look, we can talk evolution versus creation in the comments, but there is no denying the evidence presented in On the Origin of Species had people turning heads and questioning everything they thought they knew. Its full title, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life kinda explains it, but basically, Charles' book gave us the idea that species evolve over generations through the process of natural selection, which he backed up with evidence from the Beagle expedition in the 1830s, which to my disappointment had nothing to do with the dog breed beagles. Number five, the potato famine. 
The potato, so rugged, so versatile. Think of all the ways you can prepare a potato. Boiled, broiled, baked, mashed, pan fried, deep fried, french fries, hash browns, latkes, and sometimes you can put them in soup or stew. Usually pretty cheap and filling. The food of peasants and I love it. However, during 1845 Ireland, a fungus outbreak was taking hold of potato harvest all over the country, thus creating a large famine that would see over one million people perish in a famine. Queen Victoria tried to help but was ineffective. And by help, I mean the same effort I put into reaching for the TV remote that's too far away on a lazy Sunday. Number four, body snatching. Look, back in the day, making a buck was not so easy. Some people who had absolutely no morals went this route. Basically, you wait around for a recently vacant grave to be not vacant. And before the soil can settle, you remove the inhabitant of said grave and go to your local university and say, Right, I've got this here fresh non-mangled corpse, give it some money and it's all yours. And Bob's your uncle, you are now the very bottom of the barrel, the tritus of human existence. But hey, you made some moolah and can afford to eat your next meal. Honestly, while you may be the worst of the worst people, it's partially the doctors and schools that are to blame for even accepting these fresh, illegally exhumed corpses for study in the first place. It may not sound like a specific event, but um, some people dressed up for it, so there's that. Number three, the tube in it. The London Underground, baby, the world's first subway. Which, let me tell you, it's kind of annoying living in Canada when you have two very popular franchises that share two common names for a rapid underground train. Metro and Subway, right? It's so annoying. You Google Metro and Subway and then the grocery store comes? I never have that. Okay. It's, maybe it's that, a me thing. A it's a me thing. Tunnels underneath the city and trains travel through it. It's simple. Well, the first one was opened in 1863, which is an engineering feat to say the least. And it feels like forever ago. I mean, that's older than Canada for crying out loud. When you think of the Victorian era, you think horses, carriages, top hats, and orphans asking for more gruel. Mind you, the locomotive was different from a modern one, but this is a very modern idea, especially considering that there's no cars yet. Kind of a weird thing. Number two, the telephone. On March 7th, 1876, Scotsman Alexander Graham Bell got a patent for his invention of the telephone. Three days after acquiring the patent, Mr. Bell made his first phone call to his assistant, Thomas A. Watson, saying, Watson, come here, I want to see ya. And that was that. And we've gone downhill ever since. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. The telephone is a huge groundbreaking invention, allowing people to communicate across vast distances. But the phone addiction some of us have to deal with now, man, it's rough. Alexander Graham Bell was born in Edinburgh, Scotland, and the whole reason he became interested in the idea of creating the telephone was because of his mother, who was deaf, and his father, Alexander Melville Bell, who was a teacher of elocution, and was famous for the phonetic transcription system he had developed to help the deaf learn to speak, which is really quite sweet, actually. Number one, the war to end all wars. Out of all my research about the Victorian era, the start was somewhat muddy. Maybe because historians don't want to take away from North American or Napoleon history. But the end of the Victorian era was more clear. 1914, the war to end all wars. This was the big one, folks. A mixture of militarism, imperialism, alliances, and a power struggle uh, made for a powder keg that ended up exploding in 1914. Unlike a lot of wars, this one actually changed things. Empires fell while others got stronger. Countries on maps were being redrawn. Others stayed the same. But the culture? Well, it changed too. What did it? I'm not sure exactly, but what I do know is that when sitting in a wet, freezing, muddy trench for months on end, well, that's horrible, especially when the only thing you have to look at is a red paste that used to be your comrades. It was not a good time. And it made a lot of folks go a little, you know, a little crazy. Kicking off our list at number 10, John Lennon, or should I say Jay Lennon, here we go. This one comes from 1966. Now, if you're a Beatles fan or a fan of the Lord, you're in for a treat, here we go. You definitely heard about this scandal, hopefully. During an interview with a UK newspaper, John Lennon started talking about the group and the band and how their popularity was on the rise. Normal band stuff, whatever, from John Lennon. But when Jay Lennon said the Beatles were more popular than Jay Christ, well, people got got V upset. He didn't mean anything bad out of it per se, he just noticed that the Christianity charts were on a decline around the world. Meanwhile, the Beatles are selling out left, right, and center. I get what he's trying to say, but yeah, he, 
He definitely messed up here. When a US newspaper printed this exchange months later, Christians were upset, more popular than Jesus. Look, I know what he's trying to say, but still, you can't say that, ever. Some radio stations actually stopped playing the band's music altogether. Christians gathered in bonfires to burn albums. Jay Lennon, not Jay Christ, but Jay Lennon, had to apologize numerous times at press conferences. He had to clear everything up just to move on, get some peace, get some forgiveness from the Lord. Number nine, Natalie Wood's death. Natalie Woods was one of the most talented in Hollywood. The actress was in her early 20s and already she was getting Oscar nominations. She's known for West Side Story and Rebel Without a Cause, but when she was 43 years old, Natalie was sailing with her husband, Robert Wagner. They were sailing off Catalina Island in California and she lost her life. Now her death was considered an accident at the time. With very little details, it was classified as an accident drowning. But come 2013, it was changed. It was changed to drowning and other undetermined factors. Wood, her husband Wagner, and Christopher Walken, yeah, who knew? They were all aboard the 60-foot yacht at the time, November 28th, 1981. The three actors had dinner in the harbor, then returned to the yacht to continue drinking and eating. Wood went missing around midnight, but the new information is that the couple had argued earlier that night. Now, this changes things, right? This changes the whole story. And according to a new report, that same report that was changed in 2013, after a different statement was released from the ship's captain, bruises and scratches that were considered fresh were seen on Wood's body. Woods was officially reported missing at 1.30 in the morning that night. So a lot of questions, but I don't know. How do you solve that? This, how many years later? Number eight, the isolator. All right, a little different, but still definitely weird. This image may seem haunting at first, but it's actually quite ahead of its time. The isolator came long before noise canceling headphones or lo-fi beats to study and relax to. This goofy looking helmet was intended to block out noise and finally allow you to concentrate on finishing that Victorian era paper due the next day. Now this was back in the early to mid 1900s when inventor Hugh Gernsback worked hours and hours to create this study buddy to block out distractions in life. Now this is a powerful image because the things that distract us today like Instagram, Messenger, dating apps, YouTube, none of those things were even a concept back in 1925 when this device was revealed to the public. So you can only imagine what we need now, right? We need like the ultimate isolator. It's just a motorcycle helmet. It's just Daft Punk's helmet turned off, really. That's all we need. Number seven, Mary Pickford. Now I mentioned earlier how these celebrity scandals often came from their love life and then they have to, you know, maybe there's some stuff happening. Maybe they were arguing before that changes the game. Everyone cares about who's dating who and who's divorcing who. I mean, look how often we bring up Pete Davidson today. I mean, how's the guy doing it? Really, how's he doing it? Now, as hard as it is, we can't judge people off a headline or a scandal or whatever we see. We don't know the full story at all, regardless of what it looks like or what we want it to look like. The silent film star divorced her husband, Owen Moore, around the 1920s, and then she married a man named Douglas Fairbanks right after. Now, when I say right after, I mean less than a month right after. Like Pete Davidson's speed. I'll admit that would interest me me as well, I'd have my own opinion, sure. Now the public, at first, they weren't happy with Mary Pickford. They made assumptions about how long this affair had been going on. Oh, she was married, how could she, yada, yada, yada. Her career was actually on the line because of the scandal, and that was until Owen Moore was confirmed to be a not so great guy. Turns out throughout their marriage, he was a towards Mary. So she went from being almost canceled with no job to the most courageous for telling her story, how the tides have turned. Number six, portable holding cell. Prisoner transport is always a risky game, right? I have YouTube, I see some stuff that goes on online, it's crazy. When out in public in any way, the odds that something goes wrong or they escape back into the real world and run away, it goes up significantly. The movie Con Air is about this exact situation unfolding. A timeless classic, Nicolas Cage, so good. Dave Chappelle's in that too, wild. Well, back in the 1920s, we didn't have SWAT teams move around the worst of the worst. Instead, we had bike cops with cages. It's pretty funny. This portable jail cell is an early version of our modern day police car. The concept was perfect, but the fact that this guy is sitting in a cell and could just grab the officer on the bicycle at any given moment, that's not so ideal. The fact that he's less than a foot away, that's not relaxing at all. Would you ever ride in one of these? I can barely do a sidecar in a motorcycle, let alone pegs on a bike. I don't know. If I'm not riding, I'm not on the bike ever. Number five, the Prohibition Era. The Prohibition Era was a time where they were restrictions placed on the consumption of alcohol, which of course was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, whatever portation, Asian, and sale of alcohol by the US government, all from 1920 to 1933. Real boring time. Not really. No one listened to it. Of course, this ban certainly didn't stop people from producing or consuming alcohol. It was just done in sneakier, unsafer ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead of, you know, normal drinkable stuff. This is all 
pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that's not widely known is something that the government agencies did to curb the black market sales. They poisoned the industrial alcohol on purpose that was being repurposed for drinking. So yeah, some villain stuff right there. Not just poison in a way where the consumer would get sick and maybe not want to drink it anymore, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this act alone. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials today. I mean, you know, cut to today, everything's legal now it seems, but... There's a time where it wasn't. Number four, not every state. Being a Canadian, at least, we're seeing things become legal all of a sudden, and that's weird. I'm 28 years old, and I'm like, what? This is legal now? Okay, that's weird. It's odd, but we saw this happen in Prohibition as well. Many governors at the time refused to throw away money towards enforcing or policing this alcohol ban. Maryland, for example. Okay, Maryland never even enacted the enforcement code in the first place, and eventually earned a reputation as the most stubborn anti-prohibition state in the union. Nice. New York followed and repealed its measures in 1923, and slowly but surely, it all just went away. But some states did the opposite. They were all for the ban. Yeah, nerds. Kansas and Oklahoma remained dry until 1948 and 1958, and Mississippi remained alcohol-free until 1966. That's like 33 years after the passage of the 21st Amendment. Like. God, can we click refresh? Can we move on? I'm very thirsty, thank you. Number three, the Kensington system. All right, Queen Victoria, let's talk about you a little bit. Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of it before, it's pretty awful. Yeah, I thought I was grounded growing up. This is, whew. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, created this Kensington system to control her daughter's life. I mean, she literally isolated this child from friends or family members, you name it. Her mother did this all to keep her pure. This system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every single action, including who she can see or even speak to. Victoria only had two friends growing up her entire life. She had her half-sister, Princess Theodora of Leningen, and the Duchess attendant, Sir John Conroy. Oh, and the Duchess's attendant, Sir John Conroy, well, his daughter, Victoria. Two friends your entire life, that's awesome. I mean, I only had three friends growing up, but two, that's... That's just cruel. She shared a room with her mother until she was queen. She literally couldn't walk down the hall to go to the washroom without her mother being by her side. Victoria has reflected on her childhood and she said that she hated John Conroy for manipulating her mother. She actually referred to him as demon incarnate. That's a... Uh a hefty burn from Victoria. Number two, Al Capone's brother. What's going on with that guy during the Prohibition era? What's uh, what's the other side of the family doing this whole time? We don't hear about him. Siblings can be the exact same. My brother and I were the same person pretty much. Al Capone and his brother, they had to separate a little bit. They had to play different paths for a bit. Not homies for a bit, it seems. A little different. Al Capone's oldest brother was a prohibition enforcement agent. Yeah, how ironic is that? Al built a criminal empire built on illegal liquor in Chicago back in the 1920s, but Vincenzo, the eldest of the six Capone brothers, he had changed his name to Richard Joseph Hart, of course, to hide his identity, and after working for a bit in the circus, Vincenzo settled in Homer, Nebraska in 1922, and eventually he was a special officer assigned to investigate bootlegging. Now, after he lost his badge, on suspicion of theft, Vincendo reunited with the Capone family in 1940. He met back up with Al in Miami and started to get in on that family cash that he's been missing out on. And finally, number one, ice mask. Today you can go on Amazon and get a therapeutic gel face mask for like $20. If you're stressed out or trying to avoid puffy eyes, bam, throw this in the freezer for a hot minute and you're set, just like that. You can make your own aloe vera honey gel mask if you feel like. Just click any vlogger that says the word wellness in their bio and well, good luck. Back in the 40s, Hollywood makeup artist Max Factor Jr. created the first ever face mask to reduce facial puffiness. Yeah, what a magician. And it looked way cooler too. Again, pun intended. They didn't use freezer gels back then. Instead, just, well, a bunch of ice cube shaped containers that froze individually on your face. It was an ice cube tray mask, rather. It was actually invented to fight hangovers. That's one of the main reasons. How fun is that? Now, it's a shame that this design never got, you know, caught on because the ones today, they're no good. They're too cute. They're not cold enough or big enough. Imagine busting this mask out during a lecture. Imagine having this underneath the isolator. You could do anything you wanted. You can invent anything you wanted. I don't know, sound off below.